you can uh, talk about at the meeting, okay. yeah, during the discussion. It's on, Brian. Okay. You don't need to push anything, just... Welcome everyone to the uh, January 13th uh, meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Uh, Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes, Wintrow. Yes. Askin. Yes. Sims. Here. Housh. Here. McQueen. Here. Also present, our Chief of Police, Anthony Pettiford. Uh, Director of Finance, Melissa Van Zandt, is either here or will be shortly. And Interim uh, Village Manager, Kent Bristol. Thank you. Um, I'll s I'd like to start off by kind of giving the ground rules for um, the process here at the meeting. Um, I've been trying to do that um, so there isn't any confusion. First of all, please turn off any electronic devices. Um, and Village Council, <laughs> turn off or silence. Um, Village Council encourages the participation of the public at our meetings, but with the expectation that order and decorum is preserved. The rules outlined are intended to promote dialogue, the full sharing of information and perspectives, and thoughtful analysis of the issues before Council. Comments from the public are welcomed, welcomed at two different times during the course of a regular meeting. Comments on items not on the agenda will be heard under citizens' concerns, and comments on all items listed on the agenda will be heard during Council's consideration of said item, subject to the following guidelines. I w the presiding officer must recognize citizens wishing to speak. When they've been recognized, you go to the microphone, <coughs> give your name, and state the subject of your concern or comment. Comments shall be addressed to the presiding officer. No conversations will be carried on between individual citizens in attendance or with individual council members except as recognized by the presiding officer. Do not delay or interrupt the proceedings or disturb recognized speakers. The use of profane or threatening language or gestures while making comments will not be tolerated. Individual comments should be limited to three minutes with only one comment per person. Persons with other views on the same subject will be given equal time for response. The presiding officer may terminate continued discussion at any point in the discussion after opposing views have been equally addressed. Citizens should address all staff and or personnel matters to the village manager prior to coming to council and persons who violate these rules may be asked to leave the meeting. Um, so any other announcements um, from staff or from the council? Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to uh, announce about the upcoming Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, events, day events. Um, I think everybody knows that that's a really important time for the community. And this Monday, the parade starts at 1030. People will gather at Mills Lawn School. At 11, the program begins at, at the AME Church. And uh, the theme for this year is uh, where do we go from here? Uh, chaos or community? Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be great. Booth family drummers are going to be there if you haven't seen them perform. There's also going to be uh, the World uh, House Choir is going to be there singing. And the uh, address is going to be by uh, Reverend William E. Randolph. Uh, and one thing that's exciting is this year is going to be the first annual MLK Peacemaker Award. Uh, and that has already been announced that uh, Hazel Tulecki and um, oh. Bill Hudson have Houston. won. Hudson. 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 Sorry. Houston. 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 Wait, what? Houston, right? Houston. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Houston. Yes. Yeah. Um, have won that uh, jointly. Uh, so I think that's great. And I hope everybody comes out on Monday. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, the minutes of the December 16th council meeting, page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. And page seven. I have a typo, I guess, on seven, second paragraph, second line, 
near the end it says entire entirely it noted that the entire leave the entire T. Thanks. Okay. Motion to approve. Oh wait, seven eight. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, review of the agenda. Um, does anyone have any comments or changes on the agenda? It's a chock full. I guess the one comment, well, I won't, I won't make that comment. Um, Anything? Okay. I think we're ready. Um, Lori, will you review the petitions and communications, please? Yeah, and I will. M I will mainly just be reviewing the ones that actually wound up in the electronic packet. Those that came in too late. Um, uh, there are a few that I have a, a glanced at, but I don't want to try to summarize them. Um, uh, the first is from Rick Donahoe. He, uh, most of them have to do with the CBE. One has to do with. Antioch College and the um, the use of the golf course. So, Rick Donahoe opposes the funding for the community or for the um, for the CBE and uh, is concerned about sprawl. Um, William Firestone also is opposed to the um, public funding of the of the CBE. I wrote a letter explaining how I've come to change my mind and now um, oppose this funding of the CBE. Um, Steve Heckart uh, supports the funding of the CBE and um, thinks it would be a good thing for the community. Um, Payaniak uh, Yakutis, I know he goes by Taki, Manolakos uh, opposes the use of public funds for the Center for Business and Education. And uh, Carmen Milano writes um, saying that she is also argue, that she is also opposed to the fun public funding of the CBE. Dan Reyes wrote saying he has concerns about the design um, of the CBE, particularly University Way. And the final letter is the letter uh, from, oh, no, there's another letter from Alex Melamed who supports the CBE but is concerned about pedestrian and bicycle traffic being pretty much excluded and that the design principles don't seem to be taking that into account. And, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I think there was a separate letter that I was remembering that okay. I don't think made it into this electronic packet. Aurelia, Aurelia Blake. Blake. Aurelia Blake. That's on the table, but it's not in the... Was that in the packet? E packet. No, I said it came in today. So. Right. And there's also a letter from John Eastman, and there was a letter from the Open Space Committee, and I think that also came in. No, that was that was in the packet. Um, and oh. I... It just must not be. Oh, right. I'm so, it wasn't... Um, wasn't tapped for me, sorry. Um, so this is from, uh, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I skipped over Sue Abendroth. Uh, William Firestone had another one saying he was opposed, but Sue Abendroth had one supporting the CBE and the Open Space Coalition, uh, Yellow Springs Open Space Coalition, opposing the use that Antioch College is making of the uh, golf course area. There was also the uh, letter from Vivian Daly, Environment Ohio. I usually just okay. go over the the letters from community members, right. but if there's something you want to no. en enforce from mm -hmm. Vivian's letter, I believe it was about, um, can you remind me? Yeah, it was uh, um, about uh, global warming and right. supporting a letter uh, about that. Right, for Environment Ohio. Right. Yes. And I also, I, I don't see the letter from Alex Melamed on this list, and I didn't get that, it's, I don't believe. It's in the electronic packet. Um, but it's not on the list. It's okay. okay. Got left off. Okay. I'm not sure when that one came in. 
Um, I, I wanted to, to mention the um, the letter um, from it was from Ann Erickson representing the Yellow Springs Open Space Coalition um, about as Lori said um, work that's going on in the golf course and um, I received that personally forwarded on to the council packet I've asked Kent to um, take that on to talk with the folks I just want I hope that's okay with council that that they're okay with that direction yep. for this for the time being so I and I believe Kent has had made some inquiries already yes. so I have you. a comment sure regarding that um, what I noticed when I was looking at the zoning code is that we have no definition for sustainable farming which is one of the things that the group is concerned about and I believe there was supposed to be a definition but there isn't I believe I forwarded maybe mm -hmm. one to you which that I might use and I don't know who would do that yeah. but it needs to be in the code I've got to tell you there's there's all kinds of little pieces like that that are coming to light little pieces that are missing that I don't think are that were intended to be in that aren't so I think relatively quickly we're probably going to have to have a conversation either with Chris Connor or go back to um, uh, the consultant and ask how we take this kind of first process of updating I mean they all said we were going to have to do that um, so um, but I'm just noticing quite a few things that are missing so are, are you keeping a list of these things or how, um, how do we keep I started a list okay yeah. great thank you so if you can add that to your list again mm -hmm. that would be yeah. Ken, that would be great um, so we'll move on to public hearings and legislation um, First is the correction of a clerical error to Ordinance 2013-28, Supplemental Appropriation for Fourth Quarter. She is Melissa Van Hansen. She is here. Oh, come on down. This is a, this is a quick explanation. And it does not have to be reread. It's just a correction. Melissa Van Zandt, Finance Director. Um, basically what happened um, when I was getting acclimated to the budget, there was an supplemental a supplemental appropriation that was done 2013-28 um, and basically what happened if you look at the bottom of those on the last page there's a current budget figure an amended amount and then an amended budget what happened was from 2013-24 instead of using the amended budget total at the bottom of the second page they used um, the interim finance director used the current budget so it made the beginning budget off by um, I'm not sure exactly what it is I don't have the calculation on hand but it the starting budget figure was wrong the amendments were correct and the amendment but the amended budget bottom line was different it's the new one is should read eleven five nine four nine twelve so it was basically starting off with the wrong number on the um, the supplemental appropriation so it was just correcting that and I talked with the auditors and we just needed an updated one since it didn't really change anything other than just that starting budget being okay. wrong thanks Melissa um, next is second reading and public hearing of ordinance 2013-22 vacating an alley located between East South East South College and Marshall Streets Okay, whereas pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 723.05, Village Council has determined that there is good cause for vacate, vacating an alley located west of Livermore Street between East South College Street and Marshall Street, as depicted on Attachment A, Alley, and that such vacation will not be detrimental to the general interest. And whereas pursuant to Yellow Springs Ordinance 1224.02, the Yellow Springs Planning Commission gave notice of a public hearing regarding the vacation of this alley 10 days in advance in the local newspaper. All abutting property owners to the right of way in question were notified of the public hearing by mail. And whereas at the public hearing on this matter, no abutting property owners appeared to oppose the vacation. And the Yellow Springs Planning Commission has recommended vacation of this alley to the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs. Now, therefore, the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, Green County, hereby ordains that. Section 1, the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs hereby accepts the recommendation of Planning Commission and finds there is good cause for vacation of the alley and said vacation is not detrimental to the general interest of the public. Section 2, the Village hereby retains a utility easement, including but not limited to electric storm sewer, sanitary sewer, water line, cable line, and gas line. Said easement is attached here to and incorporated here in attachment B. Section 3, the council hereby orders the alley be vacated. Section 4, this ordinance shall go into effect at the earliest period allowed by law. 
May I have a motion? So moved. Second. <coughs> okay. um, we've talked about this at the last um, meeting. This is the area, um, the alley area where uh, WYSO is. And it's basically giving them um, access. We will retain um, easements. Um, Kent, anything else you want to add? Yeah. yeah, it's the old uh, Kettering Lab building. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Basically, the building already encroaches on this alley, and there's also been another um, utility. I can't they, remember they, have exactly. an, they have an emergency generator. Right, an emergency generator that was also installed in the alley, and it's also been broken up on the other end of the alley. So normally, I'm sort of opposed to alley vacation, but this one was effectively vacated. This just makes it so that they don't have a a building that's actually in an alleyway um, but it's it's never been used as an alley or not for many many years so so I I think this is really a, a tidying up thing that's a pretty reasonable request Judy oh we need to open this is the second reading and a public hearing I will open up the public hearing for comments from citizens yes come up the microphone please my name is Catherine Hitchcock I'm also speaking for my husband Michael Hitchcock we are opposed to public funding of the CBE oh, that's not what we're talking about all here. we're talking about right now is the this alleyway I vacation so we promise we'll flag that one okay. <laughs> when it's time um, any comments on the alley vacation I have a question who will Can own that property Antioch College Thank you. Uh, and and the village retains our utility easements Thank you. Uh, Judy would you please call the roll yes Asplund yes Housh yes Sims yes McQueen yes Wintrow yes could I respond to Mr. Rose oh, sure typically when we vacate an alley half of the property goes to the owner on either side but in this case Antioch owns both sides <coughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Fifteen foot strip of weeds. <laughs> uh, before we get to the discussion of the CBE bond legislation, I learned today of a potential conflict of interest dating back to February 2006 when my husband was appointed through his employer, K4 Green Architecture, to the Architectural Review Committee by Education Village, the entity that owns the CBE property. <laughs> had left that architectural firm later that same year. In an abundance of caution, I believe it is in the best interest of this process that I recuse myself from tonight's discussion pending a review by the, by the village solicitor and bond council whether an actual conflict of interest exists. And I will turn the meeting over to Lori. Okay. <coughs> I think um, since this is a very long um, <laughs> ordinance I think if you can read the title and um, the where as is um, and then um, maybe what we'll do at that point rather than reading through everything else which is many many pages would take us a lot of time um, but the whereas is establish why it's being done and it's I think helpful to just have that being read into the public record and then what we can do is have um, Kent summarize um, the exactly what we're ordaining and obviously if anybody um, would like to have any part of it um, highlighted or read we'd be happy to do that but there's lots of definitions um, and it's a rather complicated matter so I have a question May yes mm -hmm. Pro process how many readings are there going to be of this ordinance well my understanding is uh, an ordinance typically has two readings so this would be the first public hearing um, I think we were told before that there were going to be three and that's what I'm I, I can explain that if you if you like Sure. Because there was a, because of the snow date, we moved the meeting 
uh, up by a week or back, whatever it is, which leaves only one week between what would be a first reading and a second reading. There is required that there's 10 days from the announcement in the newspaper and the publication of the summary before you're able to take a vote, which therefore there's, but you have to put it in within a certain time after that first reading. So there is not enough time for you to be able to take the first vote and the second vote, you wouldn't be able to comply with the legal requirements. So um, the decision was that it received three readings given that there was a great deal of public interest and desire for input just to give that process more time to take place. So final vote cannot occur until February 3rd. Okay. That does that answer your question then? It does, yes. I guess I, I, I think it would be good if there were one extra meeting as originally planned. Okay. So, so that what that means is we'll be discussing this tonight. We'll be discussing this a week from tonight, and we'll be discussing it again on February 3rd because we know you all love to keep coming to these meetings. So we're going to read it first, and then I promise we'll get to you, Jim, when um, when there's uh, time for public discussions. We'll um, keep a list of people wanting to speak to it. So. All right, so any ordinance 2014-01 is an ordinance providing for the issuance and sale of bonds of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio in the maximum aggregate principal amount of $995,000 for the purpose of paying a portion of the cost of acquiring and constructing certain permanent infrastructure and roadway improvements in the village together with necessary appurtenances thereto and authorizing a bond registrar agreement and a bond purchase agreement. Whereas this council by resolution number 2006-15 passed April 3rd, 2006, authorized the village manager to participate with the Department of the Army Corps, Army Corps of Engineers, USACE, in the design and construction of the Center for Business and Education Water and Sewer Infrastructure Improvements, which project is located on the northwest corner of the intersection of Dayton Yellow Springs Road and East Enon Road in the village and the county of Green, in the village and the county of Green, Ohio, well, in the village of Yellow Springs in the county of Green, Ohio, and whereas the village manager has executed an agreement with USACE for design and construction assistance for the Yellow Springs Center for Business and Education Water and Sewer Project, effective May 14, 2007, the USACE agreement, and whereas in addition to the design and construction of certain water and sewer improvements addressed in the USACE agreement, the village hereby determines to proceed with the acquisition, construction, improvement, and installation of further permanent public infrastructure and roadway improvements described herein as part of the Center for Business and Education project. And whereas this council finds and determines that it is in the best interest of the village to issue general obligation bonds in accordance with Chapter 133 of the Ohio Revised Code in the maximum aggregate principal amount of 995000 the bonds, for the purpose of paying a portion of the cost of acquiring and constructing certain permanent infrastructure and roadway improvements, including the acquisition, construction, improvement, and installation of Gateway Drive, accessing Dayton Yellow Springs Road and proceeding to a terminus, and University Way intersecting Gateway Drive, as depicted at, as Phase 1 on the schematic plan dated May 1, 2013, provided by Heinz Engineering LLC, LLC, the schematic plan, and sanitary sewer system improvements, water work system improvements, stormwater management, curbs and gutters, pavement and traffic control devices in conjunction therewith, together with the necessary pertinences therefore and construction and project management improvements and to pay capitalized interest on the bonds and cost of issuance of the bonds. And whereas the schematic plan is attached here to as Exhibit A, and by this reference is made a part hereof, and whereas this council has requested that the village manager certify the estimated life or period of probable usefulness of the improvements and the maximum maturity of the bonds described in Section 2, as prescribed in Chapter 133 of the Ohio Revised Code and the Charter of Yellow Springs, Ohio, the Charter, with such certifications as required thereby, including Section 46, Certification of Heinz Engineering, LLC. And whereas, in accordance with the foregoing, the village manager has certified to this council that the estimated life or period of usefulness of the improvements described in Section 2 is at least five years and that the maximum maturity of the bonds is at least 20 years. Okay, so that's all the whereas is. Now, Kent, would you mind summarizing exactly what <coughs> we are ordaining therefore to do? Sure. Okay. Uh, <coughs> We have a grant of about 400, roughly $400,000 from the U.S. government. And if we combine um, the proceeds from this bond sale, we will have the money to put in street, 
storm drainage, water and sewer facilities on the piece of property at the corner of Dayton Yellow Springs and East Enon Road and open that property up for development as a business park. Um, most of the <coughs> figures quoted here are, are maximums are not to be exceeded. In other words, we don't expect the real bond issue to be quite, a, quite $995,000. What would happen is if you authorize the borrowing, <coughs> there are some other steps that need to take place before you actually incur debt. And one of those is to go out for bids for the actual construction of the project, make sure the cost is within the boundaries that we can afford. And then you, when you know your actual construction cost, then you issue the bonds. Uh, the Margaret Comey is here. She wrote the ordinance, and she is a bond counsel from Squire Sanders. Um, and so Nola. perhaps we should bring her up to sure. explain the ordinance in more detail, hopefully in ways that regular people can understand and follow to some degree. Thank you. There. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Margaret Comey. I've met most of you before. Um, and I work with Squire Sanders, and we are public finance attorneys who work on uh, tax exempt municipal bond financings for public improvements. And so um, I drafted this ordinance, and what we have tried to accomplish here, and first I should say that I'm, I'm quite humbled because I know I'm in the room with a lot of people that have both JDs and MBAs and master's degrees, and, and in addition to being uh, very passionate community citizens. So um, I hope I can address whatever questions you may have. Uh, the intent of the bond ordinance, it's sort of like where do you cut into the circle? Because at a given point in time, we don't really know what the actual bid prices will be that come back after you bid the improvements if you proceed and if you do that. Um, it's actually been the case in the last, um, certainly since the beginning of the Great Recession, that bids often and usually come in under estimate. Um, so what we've tried to do is use maximum amounts and then at the point in time where you actually price the issue we would expect the principal amount to be less we know that the inter we we expect that the interest rates will be less um Connors and company uh ran some estimates based on the market today and um uh, on a 20-year roadway issue, the uh, rates for each maturity, because over 20 years, they're different maturities. So if I buy the bond that matures in the first or second year out, it's, it's short-term paper. So, um, you know, the interest rate I'm seeking is, is going to compete with other short-term rates. So the rates will start out low, and then they'll go higher as you go farther out. That's why we talk about the net uh, uh, interest rate cost or the, the net interest cost to the project because we have to average those um, but anyway we would expect in today's market those rates uh, Connors reports is running from 1 or 1 1.5 up to 4.75 I believe so the average of those rates would be somewhere in the middle and so clearly it will be well under six with quantitative easing you know you never know i try we always try to draft as a matter of practice ordinances so that uh so that we don't have to come back to step one again even though as we get farther down the road we have more information from the bidders and we can cut it back right if that makes sense mm -hmm. so um with that in mind what we've done is we had to consider the requirements of chapter 133 if I'm sorry if my back is to you chapter 133 you can move that hmm? oh move that okay it's over here better um, chapter 133 of the Ohio revised code is what is our version of the uniform bond law so that those are our statutory requirements that we have to meet um, in addition, we have to consider constitutional requirements in Ohio. There are certain debt limitations that are contained both by statute, but in this, this case, we consider the 10 mil indirect debt limit. Um, 
and then we um, of course consider your charter provisions and um, there are some unique provisions in your charter that may not apply to another uh, village or municipal corporation so we consider all those things when we draft this and make sure we comply with each of those and in the end the 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 goal is to um, set out the parameters of the financing which are then uh, the actual terms are set I would expect if you proceed after you get bids for your project and before you award those bids when we have an idea of what the all-in numbers are one thing that we're also um, sort of wary of right now is that um, with the announcement by the Federal Reserve that the quantitative easing QE3 may be um, lifted or eased off there is the the thought that um, and I always have to sit disclaim I'm not in the business of predicting interest rates but I think if you read the Wall Street Journal or any of the financial press that they expect that longer longer term rates will start to move up and so that would indicate that if you want to keep the net interest cost down um, you know sooner rather than later is maybe a good idea um, the other consideration that we had and since I've been up here to talk with you all before Kent has done uh, a fair amount of work um, talking with the Corps of Army Engineers and we asked that there sort of been a uh, sort of be a um, fund accounting what has been spent um, and the reason is that we again we want to size the issue properly so that you a have enough you don't want to have too much because for one thing you don't want to incur that cost but secondly the IRS doesn't want you to uh, have a what they call an over issuance problem so I'm I mentioned all these things because there really is a lot of thought that goes into trying to create a document like this um, on the other hand you don't want to um, uh, be in the situation where you don't have enough to complete it or um, or if you don't borrow all of it which is fine because you're only borrowing a portion of it anyway if you proceed you would take the proceeds plus the grant dollars that you expect to receive from the Corps of Ar Army Engineers and you would have enough to complete construction I've thrown a lot at you I'm sure there are probably questions um, mm -hmm. I would also just say that um, in considering the bond ordinance what you're doing is demonstrating um, a determination to proceed with the improvements but you are not actually committed on the terms of the bond issue you could always you know not issue bonds I suppose and reject your bids um, until that point in time when a bond purchase contract is signed and um, John Connors talked about that when he was up here before that happens when you actually are at the point in time when you're pricing the issue um, and at that point the underwriter makes an, a commitment to you that he'll take the bonds at a certain rate which are priced on a given day in a given market and you commit to him that you will in fact issue those bonds to them as the original purchaser again if this proceeds on the basis that we were thinking of when this was drafted that would probably happen in March yes. it's probably the timeline so so Kent did some accounting on the the grant dollars spent because the money you're getting from the core is 75 percent of the estimated cost of these environmentally um, necessary or requisite improvements it's a portion of the project and that grant requires 25 percent in matching funds so what Kent did was go back and sort of do some accounting on what had been spent on planning and design and that kind of thing um, to make sure that we were lined up for a not losing the grant but B the timing was correct on being able to get reimbursed by the core and he's done that accounting and it and it looks fine so the 25% is, al is almost uh, complete. Yes. 
Have I neglected anything, Kent? Okay. I hope that's helpful. Um, I actually had a question from a citizen that I, I want, I would like you to explain. The final whereas in this document, yeah. um, before the now, now therefore, mm -hmm. Um, can you explain that language? It sure. seems like kind of boilerplate language, but I think it's confusing. The at, yeah. at least five that the usefulness is at least five years, and the sure. maximum maturity of the bonds is at least twenty years. Right. The Uniform Bond Law, Chapter One Thirty Three of the Code, uh, Ohio Revised Code, uh, in in um, sections nineteen and twenty, uh, set out the requirements for um, they. The legislature didn't want jurisdictions issuing bonds that were out for a longer period of time than the usefulness of the capital uh, uh, capital improvements that you were making. And so if you look at that code section, 133.20, it'll tell you that the maximum maturity for bonds issued to finance the acquisition of real estate is 40 years. For um, uh, sewer improvements, it's X number of years. And for, get my little sheet here. I took the engineer's estimate for this project, which was a million one hundred thousand, which Ken provided to me with a breakdown by components. You know what? what the roadway improvements would cost, what the uh, waterworks uh, system improvements would cost, what the ductile pipe for the you know water and this, that, and the other thing. And they, they gave me a breakdown that might have said $191,000 for X component, uh, $275,000 for Y component, okay? Then I had to take those components and match them against that section in the revised code and come up with the weighted average maturity of bonds. Okay? And so that is what this whereas is about because the code requires that the fiscal officer of the jurisdiction certify to the legislative authority, you all, that the useful life of the improvements being made is at least five years. Think of it like depreciable assets under the IRS code. It's kind of the same, it's the same concept. And um, that it's at least five years because you can't issue bonds in Ohio for to um, finance improvements that have a useful life of less than five years. So the minimum is five. But in fact, in this case, after we did the weighted average calculation, it turns out that the maximum maturity is at least 20 years. In fact, it's more than 20. It, it's right. it's in the 20s. Basically, these roads and pipes are going to last as long as roads and pipes typically that's last. Right. And right. That's right. And that's not The just sewer five years. improvements year, are expected right. to last year, yeah, a minimum of 40 years. Right. Another aspect, you know, landscaping, X years. Right. Lighting, like it's all set out in the code. So I just match that up. Yeah. And that's what that language is there for. To meet that requirement. All right. Any um, questions or comments from council, and then I promise we will get to questions from the citizens. Anybody want to want to make any questions or comments at this point? Okay. Um, I'm going to open it up to citizens' comments. We typically, uh, sorry, I've got to type in my password again, so it always throws me off a little. Um, we typically allow three minutes per comment and we've got this new fancy uh, thing <laughs> and I don't know how to use this new fancy thing but you're going to use it. Ah. Ah, okay. Because right. normally it's been my cell phone and I get so <laughs> engrossed I forget to turn it on. I, you know, so this is really much better I think. <laughs> um, so Judy is, we're going to try this new fangled system um, and you will be able to see how much time you have left, which is much better. You won't uh, wonder if I'm giving preferential treatment to my friends or something like that. Um, so I need to create a list. And I know that uh, we already had a lovely person in the brown sweater wanting to get up and speak, and that Jim Rose also raised his hand. Can you tell me your name quick? Bill Firestone. Bill Firestone wants to speak for some reason. <coughs> Um, 
Yeah. I don't have my... Oh, Demi! Yes! <laughs> Sorry, I gotta have my... Anymore, I have to have my glasses on, and they're very smudged. <laughs> they are. Yeah, can you tell me your name? Allison Moody. Allison Moody. Okay. Um, yes, anyone else wanting to speak? Uh, yeah, back in the back, and then... Hans Jacobson. Hans Jacobson. And then... Judy Rose, of course. Suddenly I had that moment of blanking in my head, which happens a lot. Yeah. Lisa, Lisa Abels, of course. Um, why don't I stick with that, and then we'll do another, um, another set once we've heard from all of these people. And what I would say is um, try not to do too much repetition. Pay attention to what other people are saying, and if they've already said it, trust that we are hearing it we're taking it in and um, our general practice is we don't engage in a kind of back and forth we try to collect a lot of questions and then if there's questions we can answer on the spot we try to then answer them at the end um, but sometimes you're asking questions that we don't have the information or nobody does um, so we will just probably just sort of take those and, and take them into consideration and, and uh, if, we, if they need to be researched, we, we try to do that research between now and the next meeting. So um, if you would c go ahead and come up right. and remind me of your name because I didn't write it down, so I had to just write the color of your sweater down. Right. <laughs> I'm the woman in the brown sweater. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Catherine Hitchcock. Catherine Hitchcock. Thank My you. husband, Michael, and I have lived in Yellow Springs almost 30 years. Um, I want jobs and I want more jobs for people who live here. I do not support public funding for the CBE. I think because it's very risky, I think it's, we just don't know if it's going to work. And there's evidence out there that says that there's a pretty good chance that it might not. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing that I'm concerned about too is that we're not, uh, it doesn't appear as if there's, there are other places in town, I think, that we could collaborate with, we could do some planning with, there are spaces uh, that could be developed. That seems to me to be more in the spirit in which we work in this town. We work with other people where there is the opportunity to um, make something that out of space that's already here. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And of course, we even though you have three minutes and you're allowed to use all of it, if you don't, we are also grateful to you for being <laughs> succinct. <laughs> so um, the next person on the list, I believe, is Jim Rose because he had his hand up earlier. <coughs> Thank you for this opportunity. I uh, am not an official member of a small vocal posse, but I am a concerned citizen who shares the, some of the concerns that I think are probably represented among the audience here this evening. And uh, I am particularly concerned about the possibility that there will not be an opportunity for a referendum, because the third reading apparently takes place after the due date for application for referendum passes. I find that to be, if it's true, a very unfortunate reality. And I hope council will bend every effort to make sure that the village citizens will have the opportunity before this is passed into legislation to vote up or down on the, on the proposition. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right, Bill Firestone, you're next. Hi, I'm Bill Firestone. I would like to um, preface my remarks with a question to the supporters of this project. Many of us in Yellow Springs are internet entrepreneurs in the process of reinventing ourselves in response to a rapidly changing business environment. Why should we be asked to subsidize your brick and mortar fantasies? Just for fun, let's pretend you're spending your own money. You've already heard the flashy sales pitches. I have here an important document that I believe all council members should familiarize themselves with before voting on moving forward with CBE. This document reveals or gives a glimpse at the inner workings of the CBE. I'm going to read to you verbatim excerpts, excerpts from this public document. 
The name of this document, which was filed on March 13, 2006, is the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions for the Center of Business and Education, and it is still a live document as of last week. It's still at the Greene County Recorder's Office, and as far as I know, as of last week, has not been replaced with another document. Section 1 definitions, 1.4 1 architectural guidelines, the set of standards, rules, and regulations that may be adopted by the Architectural Review Committee. 1.5 Architectural Review Committee, the individual or individuals designated who shall review and either approve, modify, or reject all development, construction, landscaping, and site plans. Section 4 Approval of Plans. The committee, at its discretion, may waive the requirements for any of the foregoing plans that it deems are not applicable or material. The Architectural Review Committee shall not unreasonably withhold approval of any plans that conform in every way with the architectural guidelines. Section 6, Variances. The Architectural Review Committee shall have the right to approve alternates to or other variations from the architectural guidelines without the necessity of granting a formal variance. Approval of plans and specifications by the committee containing items that do not conform to the architectural guidelines shall constitute sufficient authority to depart from the architectural guidelines. Section 12, duration and termination, 12.1. All of the covenants and restrictions shall run with the land and shall be binding until the 30th anniversary after the recording of this declaration. And there's opportunity for 10 year extensions after that. Okay, last section I wanna read, section 3.1, section three, architectural review com committee, 3.1. The architectural review committee shall consist of not less than one person and no more than three persons. Initially, the Architectural Review Committee shall consist of one person, Ted Donnell. This is a highly restrictive covenant mandating very expensive development. If you get a chance, head on over to Progress Drive in Beaver Creek to see how fancy the buildings are. They're not fancy. This project will be bad for our public schools. A TIF would delay increased revenues to our schools. Superintendent Basor has already indicated that he needs $200,000 more dollars a year to implement, the po to implement the popular 2020 plan. Without a TIF, if private development was successful, increased taxes would flow immediately to schools. Tell someone with a kid in the schools that they'll get their money 20 years down the line, don't worry about it. Beaver Creek schools refused the TIF demanded by the Green. The Beaver Creek School Board told the Green they knew that the development would happen with or without the TIF. If you doubt my word, give my friend Cheryl Shedden a call in Beaver Creek. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Demi Reber, you're next. Thank you, appreciate your comments. It's kind of a fire alarm that goes off, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna talk quick before it goes <laughs> dinging at me. Um, okay, I wanna say first of all that uh, I attended the forum on last Thursday that was uh, initiated to give a chance to people who had serious concerns about public funding. Uh, and so there were some other voices there. And I hope that council will look and listen to this forum. Uh, there were several important things that happened there. First, we heard perspectives from three business women with experience in city planning, mortgages, and real estate and development. They all talked about further information needed to assess the risks, uh, the risks the village is taking. They raised questions that have not been discussed here yet. Um, I can't go into specifics. I hope maybe some people here will speak later, including some of the things, including how this plan fits into the current state of the market and a variety of procedures that would yield more information like risk assessments. They also talked about gaps that appear to exist in council and CR's procedural behavior, which if corrected would make for better tracking and transparency. They questioned the plan that calls for creating an infrastructure design, that is what we've got going now to fund, e.g. a road through the middle of the cornfield and a cul-de-sac before any businesses have expressed interest in being there. How can we know what will be suitable for these businesses that may express interest? Uh, the second important thing that happened in the forum's discussion included alternatives to the current plan that are less costly and less risky 
including Don's suggestion of investing $60,000 to provide infrastructure for frontage instead of a million dollars as planned. The discussion itself began encouraging people to speak of their visions for alternatives. They spoke enthusiastically about visions that would be more in keeping with what they value in Yellow Springs. Many of them called for using CBE to launch Yellow Springs on a path to make it a mecca of sustainability, linking organic agriculture initiatives with Midwest Sustainability Program, teaching and living sustainability projects for farm-to-table enterprises, renewable energy. People spoke with much feeling about what they care about in Yellow Springs and how we could better use the million dollars to address that. Others here can speak with greater specificity, but I just wanted to point out that the forum presented important new information and, um, and vision and hope and energy, all of which makes it so important to not vote this legislation in at this moment. Finally, it appears that the fear that of losing the 400,000 has been exaggerated. Let's take the time to do this right. Thank you. Uh, Allison Moody. I would like to urge council to vote no on allocating additional public funds for the CB under co uh, community resources current plan. Based on expert opinion that clearly explains why this is a bad investment, the personal opinion of m many villagers expressing their opposition to the project, and the imminent threat of referendum, I cannot conceive as to why a single council member would vote yes tonight. Community Resources has had 15 years to court businesses and developers to their project. There is a reason why no one in the public, private sector had, will invest money into this. Demand drives development, and there is no reliable demand for the CBE. Community Resources argument as to why we need to, as to why they need our money to expand infrastructure is to provide shovel-ready land for future users. I agree that this is something that can sway a business to build, but that objective can be accomplished by the plan that Don Johnson has presented. This would cost a fraction of the present request, less than $60,000, and would provide infrastructure to the first phase of development. Funds from the sale of the land could be reinvested by CR to complete the remaining infrastructure, therefore investing their money and not ours. Equally important, Community Resources has not th done their due diligence in presenting a convincing argument as to why this is a sound investment. Their responsibility is theirs and should not be put on the shoulders of everyday villagers to convince you otherwise. After all, they are the ones asking for our money. I'm dis disappointed by the lack of willingness to compromise by community resources. Myself and others have publicly and privately given multiple solutions that would appease, appease both sides of this argument. This is not an us versus them issue. We are all here because we want what is best for Yellow Springs. This is collective money being gambled and we all de deserve ample consideration. Compromise is possible. In conclusion, I believe Yellow Springs should be a beacon of light for a just and truly sustainable society. Our public money and efforts could be better spent on funding responsible agriculture, agriculture, renewable energy, the arts, and educating others about these ideals. I have ideas for environmentally responsible commercial and residential development that would provide jobs and affordable housing for people who already live here. I also have ways for existing buildings, including, including those owned by the village, to become nearly net zero energy efficient for little to no initial investment and also receive monthly revenue from those improvements. If anyone on council would like to discuss these ideas or the compromise solutions for the CBE, I'd be happy to meet with you at your convenience. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Okay. Uh, Hans. And then after Hans will be Judy. And after Judy, Lisa. Ladies, gentlemen, thank you. I'm Hans Jacobson, a uh, village resident. I think it's wonderful that we're trying to improve the economic condition of Yellow Springs. That's excellent. I do have, I guess my question is kind of a point of order and I'm wondering why this is railroading forward. If Karen Winthrow was the deciding vote on the CBE referendum and she has excused herself from the conversations, 
because of a possible conflict of interest. Shouldn't she have recused, recused herself from the vote uh, that happened on the 16th? And what are the forces that are continuing to uh, push this forward? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Hans. <coughs> All right, uh, Judy Rose, you're next. I merely want to add another voice to, to many that have been up here saying that I do not support the use of my tax dollars for this CBE project. I believe that CBE has had ample time to be successful if they're going to be successful and I don't see any evidence that indicates to me that just paying to have this infrastructure done will make them more successful. In fact, it might even make them less if the organizations that want to move, move here don't find the infrastructure layout convenient. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Lisa Abel? So I get four minutes, three minutes, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm looking for kind of the big picture economic issue here. Um, so if I look 10 to 15 years back, we started losing um, ENIAC Publishing and Vernet. Six years ago, we passed what appears to be a permanent tax increase for property taxes of $760,000 a year. I don't see that going away, and in fact, um, that's probably replacing the income we got from those other businesses that are gone. The schools are going to be looking for probably an increase in taxes at some point in time to keep their um, keep their their schools going. If I look forward, wages and benefits for um, staff are going to continue to go up. Um, we've seen some decrease in staff, fairly quietly attrition uh, at the, at the uh, assistance for village manager uh, level. I don't know how much more staff can be cut in the, in the years coming. So then I want to look 10 to 15 years ahead, and I'm looking for um, something progressive, which would be future thinking, which would be planning for the future. How do we plan to cover for these increases in, in spending that we're looking at? Um, and I, I, the only plans I've heard are things like, well, let's have any at college do it. Well, uh, they've got a college to run. They've got to prove that they can keep themselves afloat after they stop giving free rides to every student. And they've got a lot of work ahead of them just to run their college. Um, the other thing I've heard is, well, community resources could have done this and didn't. Um, I, was, I was a member of community resources for a number of years, and um, we did a lot of work to secure funding, to secure land, to move this process forward. And um, one of the big things I learned is when you get um, funding from the federal government, it takes about 10 times longer than, than uh, you expect. So. We haven't been sitting on our thumbs uh, on this project. In fact, it's as far along as we could get it before the ODOT money disappeared. And just lastly, just to re-emphasize that the, the businesses that are going to go in the CBE will generate the kind of property tax, income tax, that will sustain and move this village forward. It will not be retail. It will not be restaurants. It will be... Um, it, it'll be more industrial, possibly industrial, probably more like professional offices um, and services. Could be something with these agriculture ideas, which I really love to hear about. So um, anyway, just want to add my support there. Okay, perfect timing. Thank you. Um, all right, I, I can take a, a, a few, another list. Uh, Chrissy Cruz will be the next on the list. Uh, tell me your name. I can, uh, Jean, Jean. Okay, sorry. It's a little hard to see in this light, and as I say, my glasses are smudged, <laughs> and I have that moment of 
deer in the headlights. I know you, but I can't think of your name. Um, anybody else? So I've got Chrissy Cruz, Jean Ballantyne. Any other? Oh, Judith Ezekiel. And Jerry Sutton. Okay, well, we'll stick with those four names for now. Um, so Chrissy Cruz, go ahead and come on up. Hello, my name is Chrissy Cruz. Um, I want to say I object to the public funding of the CBE, and I want to use some of the words from community resources themselves to explain part of why I am objecting to the public funding of the CBE. Um, this is a document that community resources had posted online. It's no longer linked to their website, but it's still available. It's still online. Um, they were asked, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because at the last meeting, Karen Wintrow provided us with a document that was a timeline that said, you've supported us all along. You've, that your council's voted yes on all these issues, and you've always been in support of the CBE. Well, yes, we have. Well, that was because we were being told all along that we weren't going to have to pay for it. Now it's a different story that they want money. In their very own words, they said over and over again, this document says, you've opened the door to other development and we're afraid of sprawl. How can you help with this? Well, it says, uncontrolled development occurs when there is little or no process for public checks and balances. Tools to prevent sprawl are largely within the village's control and include annexation, zoning, planning, the village's comprehensive plan, definition of s urban service boundaries, and blah, blah, blah. This basically saying that we are supposed to respect our comprehensive plan, which says that we don't pay for infrastructure. Later in this document, it says, um, the question is, how does having McGregor on the CIC land increase the ta tax revenues, therefore helping the community, especially if local tax money has to be spent to develop the property? It says, in the fourth paragraph, local government is not in a position to fund the development of infrastructure for this project. We are working with federal and state funding sources for grant money. This helps the Yellow Springs community to get back some of the dollars we send to Washington. And it goes on. There's two, there's two more incidences where they're asking about getting money from us, and it says further, the village is not eager or able to pay for much. How much of my tax dollars are going to go to this? So far, zero. The EDRLF wasn't created with tax dollars. It came from a federal grant more than 20 years ago. Village government is cash poor and does not have local tax dollars to commit to this project. And then further in this document on page 5, and this is their own, their own statement, it speaks to the development of the property. Is the $100,000 from community funds a gift as a gift or a loan, and whether the rest of the center's development would be environmentally sound and green? Community found the answer is community foundation issued a grant of $100,000 to community resources to help with purchase of land. As a grant, it does not need to be paid back. Ted Denell with K4 Architecture is LEED certified and will incorporate environmentally sound designs into the site and building plans. So again, we have a conflict of interest of Ted Denell being in charge of the architecture. All right. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Jean Ballantyne. Thank you. I thought this might come up, uh, so I didn't volunteer before, but um, uh, I'm curious about what kind of research has been done in the area, and I think there has been some done, I'm just not familiar with it, but what kind of research as to vacant uh, places, places that other businesses might go, and so on. And um, I, maybe that information's out there, but I'm not aware of it. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Jean. Judith Ezekiel. And then Jerry Sutton, you'll be after Judith. Uh, 
Hello. Um, I just have a very quick comment. I agree with much of what's been said. I'm opposed to the CBE project. I hesitated for a long time, read up a lot, um, and the arguments that have already been given have convinced me. But I just want to respond to something that's been said on the uh, internet that I've already said to two different people. I've heard from um, recently elected council members that they consider that they have a mandate, or one person anyone considered, but I've heard other people repeat that argument that having been elected in the last election constitutes a mandate. And I just want to say from the people that in my environment and circle of friends that there were many different issues, there were many candidates, and that I voted for two people um, who um, support the CB, uh, but I do not, and that I voted for people on other issues. There are multiple issues for which um, we voted for the various council members, and I do not want to hear people say that I've given you a mandate on the CB. I'm opposed to it. Thank you. All right, Jerry Sutton. Uh, Jerry Sutton. Uh, I'm a proponent. I approached this board almost five months ago with this opportunity in August last year. Uh, the world changes. Uh, we had, uh, we community resources had gone forth acquired federal grants uh, to do the design with the expectation it'd be completed and sufficient money. We lost 344000 because it was not timely executed. The balance of the money, uh, people have received recently some assurance that the Corps of Engineering money will be with us a little longer, but all it takes is a stroke of a pen. Another emergency they look for money and it's gone I can assure you that that would could happen so why do I think this is a good idea our commercial and industrial base in this village has eroded significantly in the last 10 years the last significant change in industrial base was in 2008 when Bernay tore down their former plant that took 1.1 million dollars off of the industrial off the property tax rate that to pay for that tax to offset that we the village residents homeowners had to pony up that difference that's the way it works when the village passes a levy they ask for 700 th some thousand dollars it goes through a magic formula Part of it's allocated to the industrial base, part of it comes to the residential base. If the industrial base dwindles, when our property is reappraised, we're still going to get that $750,000, even though the commercial property went away, it is shifted to the commercial, to the real property, the homeowners, the renters of this village. It will continue to be that way this year. In two th by the end of 2014, every parcel in this village will be reevaluated, reappraised as part of the six year process. I can, I'll take money that it, the property appraised value and accordingly the property tax are going to go up. Uh, so the only way we're going to offset that trend is to get some industrial property base. This is an opportunity for the village to provide an avenue for increasing our commercial industrial property base. If we don't do that, show me a better plan, show me the design, show me the alternative to the same level of fidelity of design and study. Uh, that's the last speaker on my list if there's someone who has an absolute burning desire to speak all right I'll take two more okay three and that's it can you give me your names quickly sure, Matt, Carson. Matt Carson and Mary White and okay come on up Matt I'll give community resources that they are very effective lobbyists, and they've, they've done a fine job of that. 
Um, as for actually providing a plan for a business park, they've offered stuff that's kind of all over the place. The last I, I saw was a two-page document um, that's demonstrating that you know TIF prices will offset it, and it's a very nice little chart with color. It's very nice, but um, this is not happening. You know, it's just this is not going to happen. There's no businesses lined up. It's a farce. So um, I know they've been very effective at talking to council members, but. You guys are making a big mistake, and you will see a referendum from this. Thank you. Okay. Mary White? I claim no expertise here. I'm just a villager who reads. And I read the fiscal impact report, which was really promising, looked terrific, amazing work went into that. And the very last page was a chart of tax rates. And I noted that the commercial industrial tax rate for Yellow Springs is, if not as high as it gets in the region, second or third from the top rate in the region. I'm just flummoxed as to why a business would want to come here, especially if they know that what we want is their tax revenues. I would think any business that wants to set up shop miles from an interstate, miles from an urban area, will want abatement, will want incentives. And that defeats the purpose. I'm, I'm that's my question. I just don't understand the motivation for a business to come here. And we have not been successful in the 10 years this thing, or roughly, that this thing has been um, talked about. We haven't been successful yet in, in recruiting a business that's easier to come. So I'm wondering what the uh, impact of those high tax rates is, and if that's going to be a limiting factor. Okay. All right. Uh, Lori Miller? Hello, my name is Lauren Miller. I live in the village. I have several questions. Um, it's my understanding that the uh, CR borrowed 300000 in 2003 to purchase 44 acres of land at zero interest. Is CR required to pay back that loan? And if so, when? And secondly, I have personally waffled back and forth about whether I was pro um, issue uh, or pro pro funding of of the CBE or not, and over time, the biggest problem that I have is what appears to be improprieties and perhaps a level of conflict of interest by members who are are whose job it is to vote thumbs up or thumbs down on this ordinance. Um, I think that several of the council members, one of who has now recruited herself, that you have ties to community resources. And so I'd like to ask you if you could just kind of speak out uh, officially as to what your previous contact, whether you've been a board member of community resources or not, and just, just so that this is out and very open and very transparent. And, um, and also, if somebody could speak to whether Judy Hempling, also, who was a previous council member, um, was uh, involved with community resources as well. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, one more comment? All right, go ahead, quick. Hi, I'm Anna McClure. Hello, thank you for the last comment. My name is Anna McClure. Um, as many of you know, I have a daughter who is, uh, was born with a physical handicap. Um, and what I have seen with her life has just amazed me and turned my life around. She finds other ways for how to do things that we take for granted every single day. She was born with no fingers. They were all fused together. Um, through pain, several painstaking surgeries, she has learned to use her fingers <laughs> little by little. And what I can say about our village that I've seen in the past seven, almost eight years that I've lived here now, is immense passion for the people who live here, intense creativity, very intelligent people, and I am absolutely sure, without a doubt, I can bet more than what is whatever this money dollar amount is worth 
that we can find another way to learn how to live on less, be creative, pull ourselves together here and out of the dollars, and think about truly how we can make this work for the greater, higher good of the village and all the people here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, that being the last comment that I see, I'm going to close the public hearing and take it back to council table. I think it would be good to address the issue of conflict of interest um, first and foremost. Um, and I'm not going to speak to Karen's issue. I think maybe Kent can say a few words on that. Um, but I will say that, because I saw the article that I think a lot of this is coming from, is an article by Jerry Bellow that was published in the Free Press. And I was kind of appalled by it, because it's really full of lots of half-truths and distortions. Judy Hempling actually opposes the funding of the CR. Um, and she was council's watchdog or liaison to the CR. She was a non-voting member. That was us serving as a watchdog function um, to this entity. Um, so to accuse her of having some kind of impropriety is just appalling. It's really appalling journalism. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm quite upset about that story. Um, when we appointed people to the CR, they were there to serve as watchdogs. Um, they were not board members. They did not have vote. The other thing to remember is that the CR is volunteers, and it is a nonprofit entity. They get nothing from it, and they are doing it, I, I believe, in good faith because they believe that this will be good for the village. They, they have no financial stake in it. Um, and if I'm wrong, I would love somebody to correct me, but that is every, everything on the book says that. Um, so, and I speak as somebody who has voted against going forward with bond funding. So I'm not saying this is some kind of cover up, um, but I really don't like people spreading scary mistruths about good people. Do you want to speak more to Karen's? I, I think Karen is being very, very cautious, more than I think is warranted. Uh, the connection between her husband's appointment several years ago to a position that's never served any function or done any work or gained any money, I think is irrelevant. But that's just my take on it. Can you maybe take a step back and just walk through the, the details? Because it got mentioned by about four people. So if you can walk through. Um, I, I'm not sure how familiar I am with it. They, they, created, they created an entity, as I understand it, to oversee the covenants and named Ted Donnell's company, his employer, as the organization to do the administration. Mm -hmm. And... Had left that company, but his name was still there on the record as the the person to uh, oversee the covenants that for end users of the property. But there haven't been any end users there. You know, and he's they, not employed by the company. He's not employed by the anymore. company anymore. So, no. So, so um, yeah. all right. Um, okay. Uh, well, I guess I probably should respond to. Uh, yes, I was a. Uh, a member of CR. Uh, I was approached by some members of the CR board when I uh, retired from Wright-Patterson after 30 years with a background in finance and cost estimating. As soon as I decided to run for council, I resigned from the board. So my exposure to C CR was very limited. Uh, I am now the council's liaison to CR and I'm learning more. Uh, but from a financial standpoint, one of my concerns when I asked him, I said, you know, 
What is the organization? It's an organization of volunteers. So I, I did not join CR for any personal gains, but I left CR so that there would not be that shadow of a conflict of interest if I was elected to council. Uh, so I don't read Facebook and so forth, so I haven't heard any concerns, any innuendos, or, or so forth. But, uh, so that's, that's my short life story of my involvement with CR. Um, I have no affiliation with community resources, uh, but I did want to mention uh, somebody referenced that uh, I work for the chamber, uh, and so I did want to clarify, clarify that. Uh, I stopped working for the chamber in October. I worked for the chamber for four months, and actually I was the visitor center greeter guy. <laughs> I had no role in promoting commerce through the chamber or anything like that. So. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any conflict at all. Uh, I think Yellow Springs has about a hundred nonprofit organizations, and I'm not sure how many of those organizations have boards. Regardless of whether they have boards or not, all nonprofit organizations and all the ones that I'm aware of in Yellow Springs exist for the good of the community. That that that's why they exist. I've been on the board of. Oh, six or eight nonprofits: the Children's Center, the uh, Senior Center, the Village Mediation Program, Home Inc. I was a founding board member of Community Resources. Uh, I've had a lot of experience with uh, uh, public. Uh, in my role with Home Inc., both as a board member and as the director. Uh, anyone who's been in the community very long knows that there was a lot of resistance to uh, public funding of or uh, donation of land by the community to uh, Home Inc. And during that time, um, I never understood why there seemed to be some sense that Home Inc. existed for itself. I didn't get it. Home Inc. existed for the good of the community and to provide a stock of affordable housing. Community Resources was started by volunteers in the community, people who through the last whatever it is, 15 years I guess, have donated their time to that organization for the good of the community. None of the volunteers have made any money and probably some of them have donated some of their money. I, I'm very concerned that you know, we're a village of under 4,000 people, and yet we allow ourselves to get into this suspicion of other groups because we don't, <coughs> we think whatever, they, we don't like what they're doing, or maybe we think they're doing it the wrong way. But um, frankly, I mean, I have never met anyone in this community who is who I think has been trying to get money out of something that they're doing, and I've met a whole lot of people who've given a whole lot of their money for the community. So I would, I mean, I really would like it if at least we could set that aside. We can have our differences, and that's what makes us strong. But when we start vilifying uh, people who disagree with us, we're, we're just going down the tubes. I just. And I have other things to say about the CBE. Can we, are we, do we have time? Or um, we well, I, I have one other thing to say. Uh, sure. Not only did I get off of the board of CR, I was part of the James A. McKee group that I got off of. And I also got off the session at my church because I am concerned about people thinking you have ulterior motors or some other objectives. So I tried to make myself as clean as possible that <laughs> I wasn't being influenced by another group. And I, myself, I think that's important of an elected official. Uh, there are ties that you'd like to keep, but I feel it's important that you break those ties so that you can 
unbiasedly represent the whole community. And that's what I feel the job of a council member is, is to unbiasedly represent the whole community. Did you want to continue? We can, um, we can just kind of go around then on the CBE question more generally, I think. Um, and uh, okay. so we'll okay. go because remember we do have two more meetings to go through this so if you feel you've got something more to say do feel free to write us in the meantime or come to our next meeting and speak well I think that the this topic the Center for Business and Education and the funding of it is a dense topic it has uh, a long history at least 20 years uh, I've been uh, reading the past 20 years of documents of village plans and other documents and and the idea of doing this it, it is a long period of time and um, during that period of time there has always been a certain amount of opposition to it as well as uh, trying to promote it um, I'm in the process of writing something I thought I'd get it written by the end of the day but I won't and um, I have uh, probably most of my waking hours for the past how many weeks we've been doing this I don't know several weeks has been spent thinking about this talking to people and reading about it and and when I'm approaching it I'm informed by my work with community service and the the work of Arthur Morgan and the importance of having a diverse local economy um, I'm also very concerned about sustainability and having Yellow Springs be a sustainable small community. Uh, I also did uh, work on the zoning, the new zoning code, and from that work and my work with Home Inc., I know something about the time and the difficulties in doing any kind of development on land, and I'm pretty informed about the different uh, properties in Yellow Springs and which ones are available for uh, commercial activity or, or residential and and there's not a lot um, and I'm also happy to look at compromises if there's some kind of compromise that seems like it's really gonna move something forward and also satisfy differing interests so um, when I've listened to people talk I'm not gonna say repeat everything people said but most of the people who talk tonight are opposed to at least opposed to the public funding of the CBE and some are opposed to the CBE itself I think um, uh, let's see there were some things about no businesses being lined up and I think that it's probably uh, I, I'm not looking at it as having businesses lined up so I'd like to just sort of run through a little bit of how I'm looking at it so far first of all I'm saying to myself does Yellow Springs need a more vibrant economy I would answer yes to that um, do we have the ability to generate a more vibrant economy I believe we do just like someone said we have a lot of passionate and creative people here and I believe we can generate more economic activity and that's my interest primarily I'm not interested in trying to get someone to come into Yellow Springs if a business wants to come in that's great but I'm most interested in having a place where local people whether it's a high school student who manages to figure out something uh, you know uh, in his bedroom or someone who's working in their garage or an Antioch College student or an Antioch University uh, Midwest or whomever I'm particularly interested in the kind of businesses that we can grow including the kind of things they're doing in Athens Ohio food to um, uh, product food product growing food food product um, so then another question does it make sense for us to have a, bi a place for businesses to grow I, I think it does um, otherwise if we're if we are generating businesses and they get to a certain size they will leave as they have been doing I think there are probably three or four that have left over the past 10 or 15 years that m probably would have stayed had they had a place to stay um, is it legitimate for the village government to have any uh, provide any kind of resources to a, a local economy well I, I look at this the same way I look at housing 
if it's going to support the community to provide money, personnel, land, whatever, I think it's legitimate for our government to make that investment. And I think it's legitimate for our government to make an investment in housing, particularly affordable housing. And as we have done to make an investment in preserving farmland and natural resources around the village. Um, do we have the capacity to do this? Because the CBE will involve, it really is a game changer if we do this. It's a, it's a game changer for the village government and it's a game changer for community resources. I do think we have the capacity because I think we, like people say, we have passion, we have intelligence, we have creativity, people love Yellow Spring. Do we have the political will? I don't know. At this point, that's where I am. Do we have the political will? I'm not sure about that because there's so much opposition. That, and that's sort of where I am right now. Uh, one of the things I've said from the beginning is that it's important to me to have all the data that we can get to make this decision. And so one thing that is important to me is, and, and I think Margaret uh, spoke to this, is that we don't know what those bids are going to look like. There are plenty of folks out there um, who are experts, uh, some of them are in this room, who have emphasized that those bids could come well below what we're looking at. And I think that's important to see that information before we make a final decision. Uh, I would not support it if it was well over what we're looking at in terms of what we have to invest. Um, so I think that's important that we get all the data. Uh, I th a couple other things that I do want to mention, um, uh, and similar to Marianne and I think everybody uh, on council, uh, we've all been speaking to lots of folks, and I've been impressed with the discussions on both sides. There are lots of folks with knowledge coming forward. Again, many of those folks are in this room and have not spoken today. Uh, there's a very interesting piece from John Eastman that was in the packet, um, which I'd love to hear more about his thoughts on. Um, but, you know, there are definitely experts out there that have emphasized, you know, part of the reason why private developers do not come forward is because they need to get short-term payback on those projects. Right now, municipalities are doing this uh, all over because municipalities are able to get the funding to make these things happen. Uh, similarly, uh, the issue about the comprehensive plan, and I guess I also thought we were going to see the petition tonight that has been um, that has been passed around. But you know, I have seen the the sort of three arguments that have been highlighted. The majority of folks that I have talked to that drafted the comprehensive plan do not support the conclusion that's being made that developers must pay for development. The village can be a developer. There are different ways to look at that, and if you read that entire document, uh, it's basically contradictory, I think, to conclude that. Uh, designated CIC was the second of the three points mentioned for opposing the CBE, and in fact, this is something that's being discussed right now. Uh, nobody on community resources has said that they're opposed to designation and that really becomes part of the work uh, for council and the community to look at what would we be designated designating an organization to do and I love the idea of looking at economic development overall uh, if we have more um, individuals at the CBE how does that then impact where people, for example, park downtown? How does that impact how we build infrastructure within the downtown area as well? Um, yeah. Uh, I guess the only other thing that, that I do want to say is um, I'm not opposed to a referendum happening. Um, and I think if that is the direction that we go, uh, that's great. I'm all about the democratic process. One thing that does concern me, though, is that I think it does send out a signal um, that makes the village not look that supportive of uh, economic development in general. Um, so I would love to see us be able to talk more about potential compromises, which many people have also brought to the table, if those make sense. 
But at the end of the day, I think it makes a lot of sense to really know what numbers we're dealing with to decide what kind of investment we're actually making as a village. Do you have anything more to say, Jerry? No, other than my, my numbers in the book. <laughs> and um, so far, no one's called me. <laughs> They've sent letters to council as a whole. I've been on the phone calling people because I'm saying, you know, almost a thousand people voted for me when I ran for election. So, I, you know, trying to get their thoughts and so forth. But feel free to look my number up and <coughs> give me a call. I'd rather spend the time away from here talking to you than taking away from the public time to uh, deal with all the issues we have to deal with. But uh, give me a call. Well, I, um, I wrote a long letter. I, I think I've made my position clear. Um, I support the people who are working on this. I think they're doing good. They, are, they believe in what they're doing, and they're doing it out of a belief in the good of the community. Um, I am looking at it primarily as a business decision at this point in time, and um, Eighty-two thousand dollars a year is a small percentage of our budget, but it's uh, actually a very good salary. There's a lot of things that you can't do um, when you commit that kind of money to this particular project. Uh, particularly, I think the tipping point was the development of the uh, Creative Memory site across the street, the selling of that, and the fact that they are willing to build new space on that property after they've filled the current space um, that's ready to build that involves no government involvement and uh, that's a significant com competition so as a business decision uh, that is why I have said that I will uh, vote against um, the bond issues um, but I do not believe there's been people acting with a lack of integrity on this issue and I want to make that very clear I res really fully respect <coughs> Karen. I don't think, I, I don't believe she was acting outside of her integrity. And as soon as she became aware of this old document, she acted in an excess of caution. And I'm sad that she's not here to be a part of this discussion. Okay. So, Judy, do you want to call the vote? Do we have a motion? Oh. Did we get a motion? I'm sorry, I'm kind of, uh, sometimes when I get called to pinch it, I leave you know, out the vital details. Yes. So if we're calling the vote now, then we're going to call it two other times? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you don't, I mean, you have a whole right. boatload of options. You don't have to call a, call a vote. You can vote, vote simply to move it to the next reading. Um, I would say the reason to call the vote is to give folks an indication of kind of where you're going, which you basically just did. Um, you have a lot of options in this regard. So, um, I can go either way. I've made it clear, very clear, where I'm um, planning to vote. Um, <laughs> is there a feeling on council, one way or another, about voting or not voting? Voting three times just gives the community a clearer sense of, of where we are. And, and also, just to be not clear, you, you could all vote no, and it would still go to the second reading. It would still go to the third reading. So it it's, would. it's going to proceed regardless. Yeah. No. Um, because this is not a final vote. Is this a point of order kind of question, Jim? It's a question as to whether there can or will be a referendum. Is that a point of order? Um, I am not in a position to answer that question myself. Um, and I'm not sure that anybody up here has, I, has looked into it. I mean, I can it. speak to it. And try. I've spoken with the bo Board of Election folks a number of times. And um, it, it wouldn't make a difference because you cannot begin your proceedings to start the referendum until you have a final vote on the ordinance. So there's, I mean, it snowed and the meeting was delayed. And so therefore, <laughs> it simply can't happen before February 3rd. <clears throat> it's not possible, but then at that point, those folks who want to bring the referendum uh, get a lawyer to compose the language and then circulate that petition, and then it comes back to council, uh, and then council delivers it to the Board of Elections, who certifies the 
vote count to assure that it's enough voters and if it is then there's a referendum and if there is not then it is not and if there's is there a time deadline on that for say May of this year is that was that the concern that it wouldn't come in time for the May election period is that what you're my, my concern is a pretty simple one I would just like villagers all villagers to have a chance to express themselves by voting for or against the proposition and I, I hesitate to, to uh, be uh, enthusiastic about having council vote for it and then hope and wish that perhaps sometime in the future we can have a referendum about that same subject Okay. Well, right. me, I hear me, what you're let saying. Let me respond to Mr. Rose, if I might. Pardon? Let me respond to you. Please. I don't think there's anything that would prohibit the council from putting the matter on the ballot if they wish to do that. Uh, but if they elect to take their own initiative and, and adopt the measure, then citizens can put it up for a vote at their at their uh, option. You go out and you collect names on a on a petition on the petition you deliver it to the board of elections and it ends up on the ballot for people to vote on so it can happen a couple of different ways okay all right so i'm going to bring it back to council all right quick sue is a point of order question mm -hmm. if there is a successful referendum petition until the vote is actually taking place does the legislation uh, say you pass it, does it go forward, or does everything come to a stop until the referendum question is settled? Question. Yeah, my understanding is it freezes everything, is that? Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. What is your understanding? That it freezes everything. Yeah. Then in that case, the referendum would change the possible timeline. Oh, yes. And people should know that. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, a referendum, I think, Given the current market, would cost us more if, let's say, it, let's say people initiated a referendum to, let's say, council said yes, the public initiated a referendum, the referendum said yes, also, it would simply delay it and and raise the cost. Okay. All right. So is that clear? Do you understand what he was arguing? Okay. Um, all right. So back to table. Um, do, uh, we can vote now or we can um, vote to table till the next meeting either way the final vote will take place on February 3rd the question is whether we're going to have three votes one tonight one next meeting and one on February 3rd or if we're just going to table and have our two votes on the next meeting and on February 3rd um, to and me you, it makes you, no you difference. You also have the option not to table it. Nope, if you table it, it gets kind of fraught, I might just mention. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you can <laughs> simply vote to move it to the next meeting. You are not voting it up or down. You are simply voting that yes, we want to bring it to the next meeting. And in fact, you would not have to vote on it at that next meeting. Because that vote is not binding. The final vote is the binding yeah. vote. Uh, oh, I'd like to suggest that we move it to the next meeting. I mean, I'm willing to say at this point um, I'm still supporting the CBE. Maybe next week I wouldn't be, but um, <laughs> okay. All and, right. and I'm, I'm inclined to say let's go ahead and take the vote so that folks know where we stand. And, uh, make, make a motion, uh, I, I'm, I'd like to make a motion that we go ahead and uh, take a vote on the first reading I'll second the motion okay so let's take a vote on this motion that we vote <laughs> 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 all those in favor say aye uh, aye I need to do it by roll okay. call oh, sorry call the roll. Okay. Um, Sims yes Housh yes Askland yes McQueen yes Okay, so we're going to vote. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we are voting on the actual ordinance um, for bond. Um, this is, is supporting bond council uh, and the issuance of and sale of bonds um, in the not to exceed the amount of 995000 for the purpose of paying for a portion of the cost of acquiring and construction certain permanent infrastructure and roadway improvement in the village together with necessary appurtenance thereto, authorizing the bond registrar agreement and a bond purchase agreement for the Center for Business and Education. 
So you want to call the roll on that? Yes. Housh? Yes. Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Askland? No. So I'm going to suggest that we take a brief break because I think um, people may need be desiring to leave and my water bottle is empty. So we're going to break for a few minutes and we're going to then bring Karen back in and I thank you for your attendance and participation. Okay, that's just the beginning of the legislation. Everybody, um, please take your seats. And a reminder, we're not allowed to shut that door, so if you could, if you want to have conversations, please just go downstairs. Oh, I'm getting a really interesting What's, Did you hear that? Echo. We've got feedback going on. Um, so yeah, just go downstairs and have as much conversation as you want. Okay. Um, resolution 2014-02, Adopting Council Rules and Procedures. Okay, whereas the Charter for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio calls for Council to adopt rules and procedures governing its meetings. Now, therefore, the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby resolves that. Section 1, the attached rules and procedures are adopted. Section 2, these rules and procedures shall take effect at the earliest date permitted by law. Thank you, Judy. Um, I did find a few minor um, things that I thought we needed to correct. Um, <coughs> first, on the third page, um, up at the top, number 12, peer standing reports, it says second Monday only. I thought it would probably be better to say second meeting only um, and put that in parentheses since sometimes our meetings aren't on Mondays. Um, down under recess, um, I think Lori requested um, and I concur that we take a recess. We can take a recess after two hours rather than two and a half hours. Actually, or an hour, an hour and 45 minutes. An hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> when the room is 80 degrees. Yes, yeah, so when the room the is 80 degrees and somebody's recused and we've got half the people. Yeah. But this, <laughs> says, but this says when the regular meeting as a whole is beyond two and a half hours, right? Right, but normally, right, two, but yeah. maybe two hours instead. And it does say especially, so it's not like it says we're not allowed to take one at hour 45. <laughs> so we haven't broken any rules here. Um, and then, and then decorum is in there twice. Um, the, uh, I think the second paragraph on decorum was left over from the old one. We moved it and and changed it. So if you would just eliminate the second paragraph on decorum. Yes. Yep. I think that that will do it unless anybody else had any comments. Okay. Um, I'll, anybody have a motion? So moved that we accept uh, resolution 2014-02. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> Uh, next is resolution 2014-03, approving a bid for lease of village-owned farmland. Okay, whereas the village of Yellow Springs owns a certain amount of rural property which it traditionally leases to farmers for agricultural uses, and whereas the lease on the property known as the Glass Farm has recently expired and the immediate past tenant has expressed an interest in renewing that lease, and whereas the village manager, having given public notice, conducted an open public process to solicit competitive offers for a new lease of the subject property, and thereby having identified the maker of the highest and best bid for said lease, now, therefore, the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs does hereby resolve that. Section 1, it hereby accepts the offer of Kent Oberschlake bidding on behalf of Flatter Hereford Farms Incorporated of $125 per acre per year for the 29 tillable acres of the glass farm. Section 2, the lease shall run for a period of three years, 2014, 15, and 16, and be subject to the terms defined in the announcement request for bids. Section 3, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to execute a lease agreement with the su successful bidder on behalf of the village. Section 4, this resolution shall take effect immediately upon approval by council. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Kent, would you please um, review this a bit? Well, this is a huge step forward. The first shock I got when I moved here in 1979 was I got a call from a farmer telling me I had 5,000 bushels of corn in an elevator somewhere. <laughs> it was my share. <laughs> Share <Cheer> crop. <laughs> so that was an education. 
uh, and I went through several other missteps, but uh, we've gotten a pretty uh, sophisticated bidding process, I think. Uh, the advantage of an auction over a sealed bid is that uh, many times the current leaseholder likes to retain their hold on the land because they've invested in improving the soil. They put in fertilizers and lime and drainage improvements and that kind of thing. And so, so an open auction lets them decide when they can keep going and when they need to drop out. So anyway, and then the, the flatters have been very good tenants. They also uh, farm the uh, Sutton farm. So uh, this makes the two leases terminate at the same time and we can go through the whole thing three years from now. Okay, great. Thank you. Any? Uh, yeah. Um, is 125 per acre per year, is that about standard, do you know? It's, it's somewhere in there, yeah. We, we were getting 100. Uh, I've been told that it's common now to get 150, but it depends on a lot of circumstances, the, you know, how good the land, the soil is, and so on. So we got a $25 an acre a year increase. Uh, might still go higher. Great, thanks. Uh, any questions from citizens? Uh, I will uh, call the vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, the next ordinance is 2004, or excuse me, resolution 2014-4, authorizing the interim village manager to contract with management partners for consulting services. Okay, whereas the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs seeks a thorough, inclusive, and exhaustive process for the search for a village manager, and whereas management par partner incorporates interview references and endorsements appear to bear out that firm's ability to provide such a process to the Village of Yellow Springs, and whereas management partner incorporated its proposal states its ability to complete the search process in collaboration with Council, the interim village manager, hiring committee, and citizen participants within about 100 days. And whereas the estimated cost for the entirety of the project is quoted at $19,500, which is both reasonable and consistent, now therefore be resolved by the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, that Section 1, the village manager is authorized to execute a contract with Management Partners Incorporated for the purpose of hiring Cecil Osborne, a qualified individual suited to the position and to the village. Section 2, this resolution shall go into effect at the earliest period <coughs> of time. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Um, I can't, I mean, did you draw up, the, I, I'm not sure whether I should have I Brian or... Brian wrote the resolution, didn't he? Uh, Judy wrote it and we... Oh, Judy wrote um, okay. oh, we, it. We looked at it together. Um, I mean, I think we've highlighted uh, all the important reasons to get support uh, on the village manager search and... Um, uh, we're all really excited about working with Cecil Osborne. I think I mentioned before that uh, his daughter went to Antioch College in the 90s. He's very familiar with Yellow Springs, and, and that's why we wanted that caveat, which Mary Ann mentioned, that you know he is our principal consultant on this. Um, not really related to the vote, but I did want to say that we're now working out the process, and so citizens that have expressed interest in participating in this process uh, will be hearing from us soon. And there's still time to express your interest uh, if you have that. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Comments from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. <coughs> uh, next resolution is 2014-5. Certifying to the Ohio Public Works Commission that funds for the village share of the cost of a water system loop completion project are available and committed. Now, if you like, I can read only this section which was added to this resolution which was passed in 2013. It lacked one section uh, that the OPWC required. Okay, funding. that would be fine, right, yeah. That's fine. Okay, so. The, the section that was added was Section 5, the interim village manager is authorized to enter into any agreements as may be necessary and appropriate for obtaining this financial assistance. Um, then should the next one be Section 6? Sure should. And I'd like to make an editorial comment. It should be just be the village manager because there's a reasonable odds that I won't be here to sign the contract. Okay. Good. Okay. You're a hopeful guy. I 
<laughs> Thank you, Judy. Um, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Um, this is a um, project that was presented uh, by Laura before she left. It's for um, to add a loop, um, add wa new water lines down in the area of Antioch College, Livermore. It starts off of Cory, so it's a very important project to improve fire flow at Antioch College and, and that area. Um, and I believe that there actually there will be some benefits to downtown also. Um, we um, submitted a request for a grant from OPWC, Ohio Public Works Commission. Um, they're looking upon it very favorably, and which we're very excited about because it's, it's half of the cost. It's about half of the cost of the project. But as Judy said, we were missing basically the, the language that says we actually have the money and have, and have uh, um, appropriated the money. So um, that is really the only thing we're doing. We've actually already approved this. So um, any questions or comments, citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We're all saying aye very <coughs> with <coughs> conviction. I like that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, reading of resolution 2014-6, approving a cost of living increase for 2014 for village employees. Whereas the village manager annually reviews pay rates for employees of the village and recommends changes in those rates as needed to village council. And whereas during the preceding 12-month period, the consumer price index as calculated by the United States Department of Commerce has increased by approximately 1.24%. And whereas a survey of intended changes by other municipalities in the Miami Valley region reveals that they anticipate making adjustments in their pay scales ranging from zero to three percent with a weighted average of one and three quarters percent. And whereas having assessed the state of the village's village finances to evaluate Yellow Springs capacity to support higher wages for its staff and the history of similar adjustments in the recent past, the village manager is recommending that pay rates for employees be increased by one and three quarters percent for the calendar year 2014. Now, therefore, the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that Section 1, pay scales for village employees shall be adjusted by increasing them by 1 and 3 quarters percent across the board. Section 2, this increase shall be applied and be in effect on or on and after January 13th, 2014. <coughs> Section 3, those employees directly appointed by elected officials, clerk of courts, clerk of council, a solicitor, treasurer, treasurer, and village manager will not have this change applied to their wages unless such pay adjustment is stipulated in their employment agreement. Section 4, this resolution shall be in full force and effect immediately upon adoption. Uh, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, Kent, uh, please. Well, I want to thank Lori because uh, one of her constituents pointed out an error in my original version. This is a second revised, this is a revised version. Uh, it's just a history lesson. Uh, we have a payroll clerk and doing this, I called her and I said, do you know what the cost of living change has been over the last uh, year? And she said, I can tell you. And she called back shortly and said it was 7 tenths of a percent. And so that was part of my rationale for writing the first version. And then one of Lori's constituents said, oh, no, no, it was 1.24 percent. And so I went and I said, how did you come up with 7 tenths percent? Well, I have this formula that we've used, and it's one I developed probably 25 years ago that says we pass through two-thirds of the change in the cost of living. So she multiplied 1.24 percent by two-thirds and got seven-tenths of a percent. So anyway, but in 2010, we changed our policy. Nobody ever, ever told the payroll clerk that she should change the way she computed cost of living. So sort of interesting. So, so I guess I have a question, though. Have the employees been getting the correct yeah. increases? Well, every year you get a recommendation from the manager, uh, and I'm, I can't tell you, those, those, they just give you a figure. They don't tell you their, their thinking. I, mine did. The earlier resolutions just said, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether they under, underestimated the... We had a long conversation price. about this a few years ago, and um, <coughs> a I think, well, it was probably 2010 when and it was made, changed, yeah. and yeah. it was about how to calculate it. But in all cases, we don't just look at the, the CPI, right. but we also look at what our other municipalities do. We did a comparison of unionized and non-unionized, and 
um, we generally speaking have given a uh, pay raise that's pretty that's basically right in the middle or sometimes more generous than what l other regional employers and municipalities are doing so yeah, I, I agree with that policy as we surveyed but but I guess and maybe I'm misunderstanding I guess what I'm hearing from Kent is that even though that was our policy it doesn't sound like our payroll clerk was implementing our policy and our intent so I wonder it was just how she was calculating this particular one no, no let me let me explain when I worked here we went through a period of very high inflation and council agreed that every three months we would adjust employee pay because inflation was like 15 percent a year right that every three months we would look at the most recent three months change in the consumer price index and we would pass through two-thirds of that automatically so uh, and that's what they were doing but then in 2010 they stopped that and then they went to a once a year adjustment determined by council there was no formula involved right okay so no she there's no miscalculation there's no okay no just yeah. so so they're okay I'll just drop it I'm yeah, hearing from you everything's fine um, any other comments from council comments from citizens sue I certainly uh, uh, support this legislation to raise the uh, staff cost of living increase. I just wanted to point out that us old duffers on Social Security got a 1%. Yeah. <laughs> so when you, when you are dealing with issues of finance and proposed taxes and things like that, you have to, I hope, keep in mind that a good bit of this population is dependent on income which is dwindling or stable. Uh, or static and so the burden of, of an increasing village cost of living is felt pretty heavily mm -hmm. thank you yeah. thank you yeah one, one factor I haven't mentioned is we've had to recruit recently for several uh, we've been interviewing for police officers we're interviewing for electric crew members three of the four members of our electric crew are retiring uh, we had we recruited recently for finance director <coughs> frankly I've been stunned at how good the quality is of the applicants but where I would have expected to get 20 or 30 or 50 applicants for those jobs we're getting four or five or six and we've been very fortunate to get good applicants so I, it may be a non-issue but I, I question I, and I'm not I don't know because I haven't had enough experience but I think our pay rates are becoming uncompetitive. 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 Yeah, that's my impression. Okay. Thank you, Kent. Um, okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, finally, um, resolution 2014 07, certifying availability of village matching funds for community development block grant. Whereas the village, in cooperation with the Green County Department of Development, has requested a grant to upgrade the sidewalk ramps at several intersections to meet current ADA requirements, and whereas that grant request has been approved, now therefore the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, the Village of Yellow Springs gratefully acknowledges the, acknowledges the grant award and reaffirms its intent to complete the project. Section 2, we certify that the local share of matching funds in the amount of $2,200 is available and dedicated for the execution of this project. Section 3, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to execute any contracts <coughs> or other documents related to this undertaking on behalf of the village. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, this is basically the same scenario as the previous um, one that we did. We're just certifying the money. This is, um, I think, a grant of about $30,000 from Greene County Department of Development. It's community development block grant money specifically for um, handicap sidewalk handicap ramp so um, again it's we put twenty two hundred dollars into it and we're simply certifying that that money is available and dedicated to the project council questions citizens all those in favor signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. thank you um, now we're on to the uh, part of the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda Paul. 
Paul Avendroth. The last council uh, spent a lot of time and I assume a lot of money on a, um, a lawsuit against one of our builders in the, in the area. And I was wondering if this council is going to continue to pursue the, uh, that track or not. Thank you. Um. I mean, I, we I, we can only uh, we can, we can only respond under the advice of our attorney, and we haven't talked to him, so I, we just won't be responding um, at that point. We can something we can bring up later. Um, can tell you about the former Cahill property. He's talking about right the strewing Stru issue, strewing, yeah. which um, I refuse I, myself whenever we right. discuss it um, publicly. So we can. Um, it's it could be time. I know that that. Something has gone. There's. I think that there has been a response. It's in appeal now, so I think that um, it could be time for us to get a, a kind of a status report from the attorney. So, Judy, could you or Kent, could you mention that to Chris if we could get a status report? Uh, and anything else? I'm sorry. Anything else? Okay, um, now we're going on to special reports, and we have uh, Chief Anthony Petty Pettiford here. He um, has some things uh, going on with the police department that he wants to talk about. Come on up, Tony. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the things that we're going to be working on in, in 2014. Um, as Mr. Bristol said, we are uh, finishing up our process for interviewing a police officer. Uh, we have some really good candidates. Uh, it's going to be a little bit tough um, uh, picking from the ones we have. Uh, we have a lot of experience that wants to come to Yellow Springs and join our department. So uh, we're trying to finish that up. Um, next week, we'll also be starting our interviews with um, our part-time dispatcher positions. Uh, the, um, our current records management system is New World. Um, and with that system, we haven't really been utilizing that system to its, its fullest. Uh, right now, we are working with our IT department and trying to push a lot of information to the car so we can keep our officers on the street. They'll be able to do reports inside of the car and push it back to the building. So that kind of keeps them out of the building and more onto the streets. So we're going to be working with IT to work on those portals and, and talk more with the Xenia Communication Center. Um, we also are going to continue to work with our schools. Uh, we're working on one major project, um, which is called Safety Town. Um, this is a program for children that teaches safety about fire, pedestrian traffic, uh, guns, poisons, drugs, and who is it safe to talk to in public. Um, the name Safety Town, what we're going to do is build a replica of Yellow Springs. Um, this is more geared to our kindergarten and first graders. So we'll build this replica of Yellow Springs and teach them the, the safety rules and, and how to maneuver around town. So we want to start at a younger age and, and work up into our first graders. Um, Officer Brian Carlson has put a lot of work into this program. He's been working with Mills Lawn. Uh, we think for the first year we are going to uh, stick with the walking to school, the crossing the streets, obeying, obeying traffic laws, um, safety when riding bikes, and also who is it safe to talk to if you need help. So those are our major topics that we'll be working on this summer. Um, and with the high school, I just met with two, uh, two of our seniors in the school, and we have came up, we've come up with where either myself will go out to the high school and we'll meet with a, like a body of, of leaders in the high school, and they'll get to talk to the police or talk to officers and, and be able to tell us what's going on in the school, and we'll kind of tell them what we're looking for and, and open up those communications with the high school. So we'll be working on that project. Um, we'll continue to, to push for a website for the police department. Um, that's going to be where when you go to the village website, you'll hit the police department and you'll open up a full page with the police. We feel that that is where we can get a lot of information pushed out to the public. Um, you'll click on that website. You'll have tabs to where you can go to. So any information or how to go about following reports, how to get with us will be on that website. Um, and with that being said, we've also implemented a tip line. 
to where if somebody does not want to actually come in and physically talk to us, they will be able to call this number anonymously, leave information on there, and every tip that we get, we will follow up on. So um, that is in place. We've tested it, and it's up and running. But now we just have to get that information pushed out. Um, this is going to be ongoing. We are still working with our policy and procedures. Uh, my goal is to work under a professional accreditation procedures. It's, uh, it's called CALEA. Um, and CLIA stands for Commission for Accreditation for Law Enforcement Association. And these are just high professional standards with policies and procedures that will be held uh, for our department. Uh, we'd like to put that in place and at some point in the future look at it being an accredited professional department. So, um, and finally, um, we will continue our training of our officers. Um, this is also a major standard in, with CALEA. Um, training has always been a priority for me and to make sure our officers continue training, uh, receive training and information uh, to better handle any type of call that they call upon. You know, some of that training is our firearms, our CPR, our criminal law updates, um, and this is provided by the Greene County uh, Prosecutor's Office at least twice a year. Uh, we also work with our active shooter and our cri um, critical incident training, our CIT training. So those are just some of the highlights and things that we're going to be working on in, in 14. Um, with the training, is there, um, is there any planned training? I know that there are programs related to mental health. Mm -hmm. are there, is that part of um, training that they will be receiving? We have schedules. Um, the, I think the next one for Greene County is not until this summer, but there are area other counties that are hosting it. Uh, we have reached out and offered to host that training NAMI here mm -hmm. um, at the building we have not received uh, on word if we can get that into uh, into the village um, anytime this year but we have put that offer out okay. yeah when when he mentioned CIT critical is that that's okay that that's yeah, okay that is, uh, um, and and can you briefly talk about the status of the of the marks radios I understand that they're operational and that they're doing very well they're doing very well um, could, could you explain that explain what's yeah, the difference we, um, you know, we had a, a basic radio system that the village has used for, for, for years, and we updated to the Marks, which is a state-run um, radio system. So where we were pretty much limited to the village, we can now pretty much talk statewide um, on portable radios. So uh, this, is a, this is a state of the art system. This has been in the works for two to three years, um, and we finally got it in place. Um, Actually, the interoperability of departments came into play when we had the poll that was snapped and we lost power on to December 13th. And actually, we are writing a letter that Columbus has requested, really telling how that interoperability of being able to talk within departments when our phone lines were jammed up, uh, we were not able to call out, calls were coming in, but we couldn't even call out. But the way departments were able to get, get on the same channel and talk to each other was a major uh, a major thing that we haven't been able to do in this area for a long time so I'm actually writing that letter for, uh, to Columbus because they want to know about that and, and know that it works so for the tip line is can the citizens find that number somewhere now or? right we just tested it we got it up and running and now we have to we're going to try to push it out on the websites okay. um, and get that information out and hopefully when we get that website up that'll be one of the tabs that you can go right on there click on that and get that information and be able to call in right I have a question about that too are when people call are they talking to someone or are they leaving a message just leaving a message and I just have some concern that it could be abused you know that people could use it to harass people yeah. do you ha I mean is this something that exists in other communities yeah it, you know it all depends on how it's used we hope that is it is not used for those purposes um, but we will be able to screen it if there's something on there that's not for information or wise or it's just uh, we'll, we'll look into it if it's something that needs to be looked into we will but if this is something that there's, there's nothing there that needs to be handled um, we'll just go to the next one but they will all be reviewed also you said that you're going to be working on some policies and procedures to be accredited well, it's a, it's a professional accreditation with law enforcement. It's just higher standards that are held. So some de for your larger departments, the standards are more. For our size, our size department, we're probably looking at 
20 standards. And can you give an example of what kind of standard? Operational standards, um, how, we, how we handle our reports, how we um, uh, report um, calls, how our evidence room is, is conducted, how we, how we run it, and how we collect evidence. So it's just standards on our day-to-day -day operation, but we're held to a higher standard on the professional level. It's a very ambitious goal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we have a we have a very good department, and I think that is one of the goals that we're going to shoot for and, and get onto that level. Mary Ann, is it your concern that people use a tip line to harass their neighbors or something? Yeah, that just occurred to me that I mean it would be easy to do. You know, someone doesn't like someone, I you know call them up, and say that they did something that yeah. they didn't really do, and then the police come out and. Let's hope that doesn't happen. One other quick question. I, I remember you mentioned that you have a Twitter account. Yes. What What is that Twitter yes, account? My son got me hooked into the social uh, the social media. I, uh, is chief at YSPD. Um, so uh, he is teaching me how to get on there and start to to put information on this Twitter account. Um, I have one follower so far, so <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting there. So, uh, but we're pushing that information out, and and he's kind of showing me how to get on there, and and you know, just like when we had the power outage, we can we can start pushing information out when, when we get it. So, to my but he's trying to bring me up into that into that level of uh, social media. So, are are you interested in Facebook? Um, just because we're going to be talking about it. it's one of our it's one of our retreat topics. And I, I just wanted to know if we would add that to the conversation. Yeah, if you are. what I'd like to do is get somebody that's Facebook savvy um, within the department that can that can maintain it and, and watch it. Um, I don't think they really want me to touch it, but they need somebody to get in there and just and just monitor it and and get information back to us. And it's the same thing as the Twitter is pushing information out. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Um, oh, uh, any questions? I actually have a question. Okay. I'm just curious about. Can you come you up? Do you need, need to come up to come that. up and say the name. I know it's a pain. My name is Elisa Meyer, and I just had a question. When you t were talking about forming a group at the high school, uh, a group of leaders, are these student leaders or are these uh, faculty leaders? What? Define leaders, if you would. We just talk about student leaders um, people that just get a small group and be able to, to talk to them about issues that they may be having at the school. So it was a conversation that I had two high schoolers today. We thought it was a good idea to get the police kind of in, in, embedded out into high school and, and see us around. So not only just me, but other officers could be, to, to be in these meetings at different times. So. And, and how are you choosing these leaders? I wouldn't. The kids are going to go to themselves. Ah, uh, yes. Hello, my name is Taki, T-A-K-I. Uh, last name is M-A-N-O-L-A-K-O-S. I hope that was slow enough. Uh, I uh, <coughs> thank the Chief for his comments. Uh, I think uh, everything that was mentioned is certainly a wonderful idea. I would support more training uh, and the development of the police department along the lines of, uh, I think, the professionalism of what everyone acknowledges the highway patrol uh, to have today. So I think more training would certainly help in that regard. I have two specific questions that don't uh, touch upon your specific comments, however. Um, I was looking at the mayor's report uh, for, uh, it references, this is the October 2013 report, which is dated November 1st. And I noticed in this report that for the year through uh, January to October, there were 510 citations filed, whereas in the comparable period for the previous year, there were 382. So I was wondering if that was a, some kind of statistical anomaly, or perhaps you could comment what citations refer to, uh, or what might explain that increase. So that's my comment to the chief. Uh, or question rather. Uh, another unrelated question was that I was looking at the council packet uh, and I noticed an item for the retreat which mentioned uh, a discussion of installation of security cameras 
uh, and I'm not sure what that was referring to exactly. I don't so know if where someone that was in the yeah, it's comment on that. It wasn't there, but um, it, it's in the uh, uh, the goals. And uh, one of the goals that Judith Hempfling had uh, put into place the past year was to have a policy on security cameras. So not about installing them, but to have a policy for the village about that. Okay. And that really starts with council, not the police department. So this is just a preliminary discussion item. Well, I don't know that we're go that it's going to be one of our goals. Okay. We haven't discussed our goals yet. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Tony, do you want to respond? I would have to. I would have to actually look at the um, statistics that we have. It could be a number of things. Uh, we handle. We have mayor's court, and then we do have uh, senior municipal courts. So. It all depends on how many citations actually were written into mayors or were written into Zenia Municipal. So that could be the, the difference in number, but I would have to take a look at this um, statistic. Anyone else? Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, okay, now we're moving on to the 2014 budget schedule. That will be uh, Melissa and Kent leading that discussion. Basically what, um, what was done was we looked at um, the schedule in previous years and tried to come up with something that would fit into the time frame that we need to uh, file the 2014 budget with the auditor, which has to be before April 1st. So um, Judy and I had looked at the calendar to see how many more meetings there are until the 1st of April and tried to organize it in such a way that it kind of was in line with what had been done in previous years. So. I'm open to suggestions, but this is just kind of a starting point for you all to discuss. So are these, I should have, I guess I should have looked, are these all regular meetings or are any of these Saturday meetings? Um, I believe that the 24th of February was, um, no, it's Monday. yeah, it wasn't a fifth Monday or fourth okay. Monday. Okay. I think we said that at the last meeting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's me. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to get used to that. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, the 24th is the only one that's not a regularly scheduled meeting, and it was on a Monday. Right. Okay. Something that we talked about that that isn't <coughs> on here Excuse is me. that it, last year you folks, for some of these, began the meetings at 6 o'clock with the, with the budget budget was six to seven and then regular oh. meeting after that and I think some of these assume that that may be the case really? how's that working for you I could I could do it I mean it's not <laughs> always easy but I can if I know about it and um, it's kind of a special circumstance it's considering that we have to get this budget done by April I would be I would be willing to to come in early and everybody else I I kind of figuring the retired folks are a little more flexible with your schedules, <laughs> except you. <laughs> <laughs> Semi-retired. Um, um, I mean, I, th I think I think the schedule looks reasonable. I mean, does anybody have any? Um, so, and then we, um, Melissa provided some. I don't know if you want to say anything about the samples, the kind of the. Um, um, there's the ones that are in color are the ones that I did um, that I created the the newer versions. Um, basically, the older versions were much more detailed. Um, I planned on condensing it just into the different um, categories within each budget, and then I would have um, available the the expanded version. So, if anybody had a question about personnel services or about um, any of the um, various lines, contractual services or anything like that, um, and what went into that, I would have that expanded version available and I would be able to answer questions at that time. But it just, it would it would make the packet a little bit smaller, maybe 10 pages instead of like 30. I think that sounds so. great. What it, I mean, Lori and I have dealt with these and, and also um, Jerry. Um, I mean, I, I think that sounds like a great idea. If somebody wanted the expanded packet, could I would you have make that available. That? Yeah, it's all in one spreadsheet. I just mm -hmm. hide the cells that aren't necessary for the meeting, so I, it's still all the same document. Right. And so and you could even make it available electronically. Mm -hmm. In that, well, I guess it, we usually get PDFs, but um, 
But she yeah. could turn that into a PDF. Yeah, I can she turn an Excel spreadsheet into a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. I have no problem. Cool. Um, well, good. I mean, I think this, so we've got the schedule. So we'll be at the uh, January 21st meeting. We'll be um, getting the capital and enterprise fund budget. So are we starting out at 6 o'clock at that meeting? Um, 6 o'clock on the 21st. Which is actually a Tuesday. That's a Tuesday. Oh, yeah, that should be no problem, actually. <coughs> Tuesdays are, are better for me than Is that okay Mondays. with you, Melissa? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So are, will all of those meetings then start at 6? Is that the kind of thing we're thinking, basically? I, I think that sounds like okay. a good idea, yeah. All righty. I'll put that in my calendar. I don't think we knew when now when we're doing not the 3rd and the 17th, just the just – the, um, the third when we're doing the readings I don't right. think we need right. to do those right. um, you're saying yeah. at six o'clock so I don't think March 3rd or March okay. I'm sorry March 3rd or March 17th I don't think those need to be early meetings that's just the legislation after we've already heard and discussed um, and hopefully understood the budget and the 24th would be just budget so you start that early. right yeah that okay. unless you prefer it. Yeah, unless you like it, it's okay. early. Whatever suits. What, what's your preference on the 24th? That's the Monday. It's I'm it's sorry. just a budget meeting, so we probably don't need to start at 6 o'clock. Oh, well then probably 7 would be better seven, for me. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because that's a Monday, so 7 is better for me. Right. Okay. So, that, so just I'll review this. January 21st, February 3rd, and February 18th, we will begin at 6 o'clock with budget discussions. February 24th is a special meeting on the 4th Monday, <coughs> just about the budget. That will start at 7 o'clock. March 3rd and March 17th. March 3rd is the first reading. March 17th is the second reading. We are going to be reading this as an emergency, but we will do two readings. As an emergency, it will go into effect immediately. Um, and obviously, because of this, um, tight schedule we we will have to hear it as an emergency um, so that she can get the budget filed before 2000 or before April 1st of 2014 so but those two March 3rd and March 17th will be regular meetings we'll hear the legislation during the regular part of the meeting and of course because it's an emergency that means we have to have four votes we have to have a super majority four votes rather than three to pass it usually that's not a problem we've talked about it so much um, but just something to be aware of Th that's the two meetings in March yes. right mm -hmm. I'm saying that because I just realized that I scheduled a trip and I didn't realize we were meeting on the 18th I thought we were meeting on the 17th so I, I won't be here I mean I think we've already made our plane reservation that's for February so you won't be at the February 18th meeting I mean that 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 will probably be a big one but but then we'll you'll be here if you're here on the 24th I won't be here we're coming back on the 24th because that would basically be kind of the summary then I mean that would be I mean is it possible that I could meet with someone beforehand and oh, sure. put it Kent whatever. and Melissa mm -hmm. I would yeah, yeah I, mean, I would, would like to do you. that and I sure. apologize and I'm Although, although you, you know, you're going to get capital, enterprise, and general. What you're not going to get is this kind of compilation. So you'll be in the hearings for for each of the for areas. each of the budgets. And then, if there are things that you need you, concerns you have, another discussion, you could have that with Melissa and Kent separately. Right. And you can also, of course, send a letter to council saying you know making clear what mm -hmm. your concerns are, so that we make sure they're aired in a public meeting. Thanks, Melissa. Um, now we're moving on to council retreat agenda review. And um, this turned into a giant miscommunication between myself and my clerk, <laughs> the clerk. Um, so you've got the document in front of you that um, I wrote and that was in the last packet. Um, the, the top part of the of the document were the proposed agenda items from the for a council retreat that were discussed at the previous meeting um, they were things that were brought up by myself and Mary Ann so I just wanted to be able to um, document those items have those on a piece of paper 
um, so that we didn't lose track of them. But the agenda that I'm proposing for the retreat um, is um, is where, below where it says tentative agenda. So um, the the point being that um, some of the items that that were proposed and that were we were. Marianne was interested in talking about were more matters of, of policy and substance that that citizens would be more directly interested in being involved with what we typically um, do at our retreats is basically talk about council um, how, how we conduct council meetings how we work together um, how we conduct meetings and how we work to become more effective so um, most of these items are were actually kind of carryovers from our last retreat anyway so um, I, I'm feeling like it's you know it, it would be something that will be helpful for us I'll just I'll just review it quickly we'll do a welcome we'll review the agenda we're going to do an around the table just sharing our observations um, We'll have an hour just to discuss agenda setting, moving projects forward, and tracking progress. Um, a little bit more than an hour to discuss the meeting format and how to achieve greater citizen involvement. Then we'll have some lunch. Um, we'll talk about council boards and commissions and consideration of additional work committees. Um, another That's for an hour. Um, then we'll have an hour to discuss most effective work strategy for council projects, including community collaborations, boards, commissions, and nonprofit partnerships. And then we'll end the day talking about social media. Um, so, um, you know, we don't have a lot of a lot of opportunity with uh, having had to cancel the meeting last week. We're we're meeting on Thursday, so we don't have a lot of opportunity to change. But does anybody have any comments? Anything they'd like to see change? I have a question. What about uh, council goals? Where do wh at what point do, does council do goals, and then where do they review them? Well, they're on the agenda in new business tonight, um, and all that basically what we're going to do is spend a few minutes just to talk about the process. Then we will we will put them on the agenda. I mean, we've got a hugely full agenda for next week. I don't know if they'll be on or next meeting. It is next week. I don't know if they'll be on next week, but um, we'll get them on. We'll have to get them on because we do and need to, to connect them. Right. Those that absolutely is a public discussion, um, but we do need to meld them with um, the budget. I mean, there are goals. If they need to be funded, we need to know that. So. When we get to that, we'll talk a little bit about how we've done the process in the past and um, how we see it moving forward. Okay. So are we agreed to the? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And where's where's? I'm sorry, I'm very embarrassed, but it's where's at Yellow Springs Country oh. bed and breakfast? Okay, I gotta get that on my. And we're going to be having um, lunch and prepared by Nora. Oh, look at us! Where's this at? Yellow Springs Country. Do you know where that is? Sorry, it's um. Hilt Road. Hilt Road. It's Meredith. So 343, Meredith, and yes. yep. It's and, and in fact, I t tomorrow I will get you the agenda with directions and the whole right. the whole bit. I was just waiting for that to finalize. So gotcha. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'll get it. <laughs> um, I I think we can I we can remove the CBE updates and information. I'm assuming from yeah. the agenda. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Goals. Um, let's see goals and principles preliminary discussion so you have the document in the packet what this is is um, a document that, that council kind of reviewed I think it was you know maybe in October it was um, Judith wanted to kind of finish up the process see where we were do be able to pass a document along to a new council so um, goal setting is never easy I mean it's 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 very complicated and it and it can really um, it, it can take a lot of time and it can get um, you can kind of go around in circles um, what we had done what, what we realized at some point is that we were spending a lot of time with these big ideas like deepened democratic decision-making process processes with active citizen participation and effective representative governance but not 
not getting to the core of how we do that. So a few years ago, we maintained these large principles, these overarching principles, but decided to come up, we need to come up with specific strategies and specific goals to actually get things done. So that's worked out really well. Um, I, you know, and I don't want to spend, it's, it's getting late, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I will read through, just for citizens, I will read through the principles. Principle two is be an excellent employer and provider of services within a responsible fiscal framework. Principle three is to be a welcoming community of opportunity for people of diverse races, ages, sexual orientations, belief systems, cultures, incomes, and abilities. Principle four is to pursue a strong economy that provides diverse employment, a stable tax base, and supports the values of the community. Principle five is to seek in all of our decisions and actions to reduce the carbon footprint of the community and encourage sound ecological practices throughout. And principle six is to provide careful, creative, and cooperative stewardship of land resources. So within those, we have, you know, we had a, a number, I mean, there's probably about a total of 25 or 30 goals, um, about three or four for each of those. And to the right, um, there is a note as to whether it's active, whether it's completed, or whether it's in process. So um, that's, and that's where, where Taki picked up the developed security cameras, surveillance, or security surveillance camera use policies. We did discuss it, but we never did develop the policies. Um, so I guess what I, what I would suggest is that, um, what I want to know is, is this process and is this outline, these outline of principles, does that meet with council's approval? I mean, does council think that that's a good way to start and a good way to move forward? Yeah. I think it's a good way to start. Mm -hmm. Okay. The principles kind of cover every area that we are about. They're about our, our commitment to the people, our commitment to being a good employer, um, our commitment to be a certain kind of community, our commitment to having an economy that supports it. So I do like it that I think the principles keep us kind of focused on all of our big overarching things and then that we then start thinking in terms of what do we need to do to try to forward those things. Right. So, so what I'm suggesting is that is that probably not. We'll we'll decide when we get into future agenda items and we start really looking at our agendas. But um, s basically, start to start to come up with your your goals. You know, come up with you know goals and and make them as as you know kind of a, um, action oriented as possible. Something that's achievable. Um, and and you know put them under the proper categories and whether we do it at the next meeting or the meeting after we'll start to have that discussion um, I'd say we'll probably spend you know half hour 45 minutes maybe first time maybe longer it's really these these agendas are are, are packed so we may have to um, we may have to strategize a little bit about how we're going to get the goals in um, and, and we haven't always, you know, we've, we've tried diligently the past couple of years to get them early. We haven't always been actually even this early in getting the goals done. So, okay. any other comments? Okay. Um, and then the next topic is proposal for upgrades to council chambers. I will turn that over to uh, Jerry. Okay. Uh, <coughs> it I don't have an actual proposal today. We're still working on it. But uh, one of the problems that we had been trying to deal with is the sound system within, within uh, the building doing, doing meetings. So I started out uh, working with uh, um, Paul. <laughs> okay. But then we realized that we had three other major issues. Uh, not only does council use this room, uh, planning council uses it, the mayor's court uses it, and BZA uses it, so it's more than just council. One of the things that we're starting to run into is, is that uh, the room has to be reconfigured uh, for the mayor's court, then has to be put back, reconfigured for uh, planning, and BZA, and sometimes there are three meetings in, on one day. 
each time the room is reconfigured, it takes about 15 minutes, but we have to call in two employees and pay them two hours. Okay, so, so that's an issue. Also, we had some security issues that we've been looking at. Okay, so uh, what I'm in the process of, of doing is uh, looking at reconfiguring the room, making use of, we've got a drop down screen in the back by the clock, making use of the drop down screen, making better use of Paul and the camera equipment, and also being able to make better use of our, our total meeting. Uh, what we're, and I'm going out to get estimates. I don't have a dollar amount. I don't want to throw out a dollar amount right now. But we're looking at uh, replacing the carpet. Uh, from my understanding, the carpet on the floor was the initial carpet that, that was went in when they remodeled here. Uh, looking at getting the projector that will hang down from the ceiling. Now that'll serve a number of purposes. For presentations, we'll be able to use the, sc the screen that's already there versus using the wall. For our clerk, she will be able to, right now we use a lot of paper, she'll be able to portray our whole agenda and what we're going through on the screen versus half of the audience having paper, the other half not. The uh, mayor's court will be able to make that a stationary unit and he, he has had, he's agreed that, you know, we don't need, he has a humongous podium and so forth that literally they roll in and he kind of sets up. I've been working with, with Paul, the mayor, Judy, uh, our uh, Jason, I did, I did say the mayor, Jason, and I will be bringing Tony, the, the, the chief, in to, to look at uh, what we can do for, for, and there are some things we need to do for security purposes. And, uh, so I'm going to bring the chief and we threw out some ideals that, uh, that we think it'll, we, we, we haven't had a problem yet, so I don't want to want to say we're trying, but since we're going to have to do some wiring changes and so forth to, to accommodate what Paul needs, it makes sense to go ahead and, and do some security upgrades uh, to the room and so forth. F file cabinets and all this stuff that you see over here will be gone. and. Uh, but uh, I have a I have a, a, a sketch that that we're working off of, and uh, but I think when, you, when we we get the final plan, the, the biggest thing is uh, I I want to get a little more buy-in from council, and then go out and start getting some estimates. Our guys can do a lot of the work, but there may be about three items that we we might have to contract for. And uh, but it, uh, as you can see right now, that area is dark. And, and even if we turn the rest of the bank's lights on, it's not going to light it up. So, you know, we want to bring a little bit more light into the area and so forth. So, uh, but uh, if we're, we're kind of in agreement, then I will continue on and bring back a, a, an estimate uh, on exactly what it's going to look like and what the cost would be. But we're, we're um, again, the, the, the three main issues that we're talking about is not having to change the room three times. And unfortunately, sometimes Judy gets caught here. And when we came in today, Judy had to log in chairs, or we call in guys for 15 minutes and paying for two hours. So we're, we're trying to get away from having to uh, keep reconfiguring the room, uh, but provide better sound so that people here can hear, plus the uh, those away from 
the uh, uh, those that are watching Channel 5 will be able to hear and so forth. And then, of course, there are some security issues that we feel that we we should uh, correct. So, so that's kind of it. Can I use Jerry's point as a springboard? I've been looking around, and I, this is not. I think you need to start. This building has been in use about 22 years since it was remodeled. And I think it's held up well and it's still attractive. But after 22 years, there are little bits and pieces that are starting to look a little bit shabby. We've got signs with letters missing and chips and paint and cracked tiles and things like that. And it's about time to start thinking in terms of just a little cosmetic freshening. For the, for the whole structure, I think. And just to be clear, I, I, you're talking about moving, reorienting us to that wall. We would be sitting with our backs to that wall, correct? Yeah, that's what we're looking at right now, unless someone comes up with something better. in the planning, planning, BZA, and the mayor are all in favor of going this way. And, uh, and then the people would be sitting here. here. People, in will, people would be at sitting. Us this way yeah looking right. looking look that and and because of the protocol for the mayor's court we will have to put a six foot a six inch platform because when he has court protocol says that he should be higher than the audience yes. <laughs> and that's why that's why they haul in this humong and, and, and that the desk is so big it takes up a storage room <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and, and we'll be able to just use his podium to set on top of the desk and that'll give him the protocol that, that he needs and so forth. But what I'm excited about is the ability to use our screen and, and we have an older community that have both hearing and sight problems and by being able to project this small print up on the screen and um, our clerk will be able to follow right along with the meeting and the folks won't have to look there. They can just look over at the screen and stuff will be there. Should make it much easier and for presentations because folks will be able to bring in a flash drive, plug it in and work a button and and make the presentations and so forth. You won't won't have folks coming up to the mic here trying to fumble with paper and get their thoughts. We're we're going to look at a at a at a podium. Good. Um, you know, not an expensive podium, but we're going to be looking at a podium where you know they they can feel comfortable. You know, in, and rest their in, rest materials. their papers or whatever, in in and speak to. Uh, council and so forth. That would be good. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I think we should definitely move so, forward. But, you know, I, I don't want to throw out numbers now because uh, just looking at a, at a projector, the figures are anywhere from 3,000 to 30,000. Okay. It's I, that, that I big put a number range. in the budget just yeah. as a place but, keeper. Uh, and, and we also uh, <laughs> were, were and, and I couldn't remember the gentleman that you talked about, Kent, that mm -hmm. was going to come in oh, yeah. and, and, and look at the sound for us. Miami Valley Cable Council, yeah, Rich yeah. LaRue is their engineer. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to get him in first, because the sound is the thing was foremost, right. and then the other things we need to do along with that. So, yep. Okay. That's very good. Thanks. Thanks, oh, Jerry. I, just, I, I have one comment. And, and first, thank you for all this work. I think that'll be helpful. And. Uh, as I look around the carpet, I, I don't see any problem with it. Maybe, maybe there is, and I'm not seeing it. So I, I, I would put that low on the list. And if you do, if we do replace the carpet, I'd suggest we do an eco-friendly carpet. I mean, there's a, the, the kind squares. now that uses recycled or that they recycle them. Oh yeah, Th there are some tears that you don't see them now in. Uh, so yeah, there are stains and tears. And yeah. So places. and I'm more concerned about the trip hazard with the, oh, the uh -huh. tears and so forth. But uh, they're, they're they're covered now. But uh, by <coughs> when we build the new raised flooring over in that corner, 
I like it to be able to match it. And from what the research we've done so far, carpet squares are the most economical. Yes. Because and they're as eco friendly. They, and they're eco friendly. Yeah. So as they wear out, the co company we was take them out. They re they reuse right. them and we, we put down new. Ones. So yes, we uh, eco friendly, friendly uh, energy friendly. Sound friendly and of course safely. We're looking. We're looking. We're looking at <laughs> yes. all, all friendly. Those friendly. Yeah. friendly, friendly, yeah. friendly, friendly, yeah. friendly, friendly. And we can put in a checkerboard pattern. <laughs> we can use them to create a spatial pattern, though. I mean, it can be to oh, create yeah. aisles and to define oh, spaces sure. um, with with different colors. Yeah. So you know, there there is definitely some design mm -hmm. benefits to using the tiles. Yes. Um, okay. okay, thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Kent, um, briefly, um, anything in your manager's letter that you um, want to review? Uh, just a couple of things. One is that Ellis Jacobs' term on the Board of Zoning Appeals has expired, and I would like to request that you reappoint him. He's agreed to do that. Oh, he's agreed. Okay. okay. I'm Somebody else a motion? A motion? Oh, so moved. I Second. All those in favor mm -hmm. signify by saying aye. 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 Good. Um, one of the issues we, I met a couple of months ago with the principals in our information technology. Bruce Cornett has done a lot for us. We are now using Maveca as our internet service provider and they're working together and we just issued a purchase order today and I'm hoping within a couple of weeks we will have Wi-Fi available throughout the Yay. building. Yay! So Hallelujah! Uh, we gotta, we gotta Scott and Tina's son wanted it out there today. <laughs> he was out <laughs> playing his games. Uh, I'd like to make just a couple of comments about the Center for Business and Education. One is, uh, one of the council members asked if we borrow a million dollars to build the street, will we have any borrowing capacity left? And the answer is yes, it'll be nearly we'll still have nearly six million dollars of borrowing capacity left so if the village wants to do other projects in the future that's not necessarily a damper uh, the other thing i'd like to point out is that we have a lot of work to do on our water system both the distribution and the treatment and the sourcing and we're looking at millions of dollars worth of work and Frankly, if you asked me to pull a number out of the air for what kind of a rate increase we're looking at, I'd be say I'd be seeing somewhere in the vicinity of 50%. It's a damn big increase. 20 years ago, over half of our utilities went to Vernay, Antioch Publishing, the college, and that's just another reason to be thinking about economic development because those people aren't just taxpayers; they're also utility customers and it helps us spread that burden over a much bigger base. So at that point, I'll stop editorializing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Is that it? That's all I have. Okay. Judy? Oh, it's been very, very busy, and um, I'm looking forward to the retreat. Yeah. I want to congratulate Judy on um, Philip adoption of oh. her okay. son, Philip. Oh, oh hurrah. Congratulations. Thank you. As, and what did what did you say in your report? You see, she's growing the village one <laughs> one child at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm doing a fairly good job. You yes, are. You are. You deserve special commendation. <laughs> um, okay, future aden agenda items. There's a lot of them. Um, so let's talk about. Let's separate out two. Th two um, 220 or 121 let's January 21st um, we will have um, the CBE 2014-01 CBE ordinance oh yeah okay um, let's see um, what about the 214-3 the easement with the Glen that, that's yeah. ready to go okay yeah, that, should be easy. that should be fast yeah. just back on the that first topic that talks about the project manager. No, that's that's the resolution. I was talking about the ordinance. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, gotcha. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's go down through. Will Dayton Pool Management be at the January 21st meeting? Yes, for, yes we're planning to have them here. Okay. 
Okay, and then you would like to hear that resolution at that meeting, right? You would like to read. How does council feel about that? So we'll be getting a report from Dayton Pool Management on 2013 pool operations on the 21st, next Monday. Um, Kent is also asking that we um, that he we at least authorize him to solicit bids. That's just him soliciting bids. That's not us committing to hiring anybody. Is right. is council okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got another House Bill Five um, resolution that that will go quick. That's the municipal um, taxation. Taxation. So there's there's another vote coming on that so we want to make sure we get that in there um, the um, the ordinance the resolution 2014-01 about the forget that I will talk about that in a minute um, let's see and and the probably the biggest discussion will be the water report um, is John John still here John uh, or Kent it, are we ready for that will you be at that meeting I will be at the meeting Scott Straley has promised that he would be there and have, and his email to me this morning that I forwarded to Kent was that he's done with the report, it's in their internal review, so I was hoping to have it by the end of the day today. I haven't seen it. Um, hopefully when I get in the office tomorrow morning, I'll be calling him again. Uh, uh -huh. My intention is that we're going to, and Scott had promised me that he would be there on the 21st as well. Okay. okay. Now if you choose to postpone it, no. you know, I could be in touch with him, but my intention is that we're, we're there. Let's try to do it. And, and we've got the budget. We've got, yeah. so and we're, we're, we're starting at 6 o'clock and we'll have the budget from 6 to 7. That's not a problem with reporting, is it, Judy, that we would be starting a meeting that's only a week from now at 6 o'clock? No, because your notice goes in on Thursday for okay. the meeting following so yeah right now okay. and it's not an ordinance we're not it's not an actual ordinance or anything that we're voting on so right okay. you're probably not even making decisions but just right. gathering information and so even without the budget that's a lot of hefty agenda yeah. items i i think we should put the village manager hiring process on there if we can to at least oh. talk a little bit about where we're going with that yeah. uh -huh. and we just talked about goals some of those are pretty fast. Well, yeah, I well, except for the except for the CBE legislation, the other legislation will be incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, I I would hesitate. Is, is there? I mean, even the easement that will be fast. Um, the pool report could be a little long, but I think Kent, we have to get on that because mm -hmm. we've just oh, it's yeah. just no, too far into the season already. Do it. There's no question. Um, um, we they do not have to. We can give them a very limited time right. to make their report, and they can give us a long written report. But their report in this body should not be more than ten or fifteen minutes. Right. I would say. Right. So five. And okay. yeah, I mean, if you tell five tell when you good. talk five to is good. What's five whatever, is good. Yeah. Five. <laughs> but but have but if they can have a written report, a more detailed written report, and mm -hmm. a brief and and. I mean, I don't know. Does he even need to come? Maybe he doesn't even need to come. Maybe we can just. Well, if people have questions, um, concerns, you know, yeah. Or does he? What do you think, Judy? You're. No, that's true. The only thing that I then I realized they had the position last year. I was just wondering if that would be some sort of bizarre, unfair advantage or other. But no, because they did it last year. No, I mean he, he has to make a report. So. Yeah. I, I think, think he probably I think should he needs come. To be here if he can be here, I think that would be helpful. So okay. Be able to confront him if they've got concerns mm -hmm. so um, we'll when I sit down and do um, when I sit down and do the agenda review on Monday well when are we going to do it tomorrow we're doing it in the morning um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw some some time some times at this Good. and I remember I don't know if you remember we used to have times yes I and think we took them off and I think we that. maybe will revisit putting those times on again I think it's a great idea <coughs> um, and then so we've got we've got one jam-packed meeting so then the um, at the Antioch College updates Mark Roosevelt um, I've invited him to come on February 3rd 
and I will tell him brief briefly you know it doesn't need to be a long but right. you know clearly there's some communication I think that you know we'd like to hear yeah um, some of the things the college is proposing I think the TIF the ordinance about the TIF that can certainly hold for a while that doesn't even have a date and then um, the project manager for the CBE you know that could be on on track for that meeting too so February the 3rd, 3rd uh -huh. February 3rd right, right. How long do you think of the village manager hiring Brian? Not long. Uh, we're just going to sort of bring forth the recommendations okay. from uh, Cecil based on our interviews. Okay. So, uh, and I'll have a written report that everybody can look at beforehand. So, we can do that quickly. So maybe just just so we're kind of on track, and and since we just talked about goals, let's have just an in, a very initial, and maybe we won't even talk about goals. Just start start to compose them and put them in the packet, and we'll see how much time we have to actually discuss them. That seems, but it won't, won't be a priority. Fine. Do you mean that each of us should be putting yeah. submitting goals and, and submit the them next? to Judy for mm -hmm. the packet? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, if you. If you submit things to me, I can put them in a track changes draft that you folks can just makes it a little quicker to look at and sort of see what you're considering changing. And, um, so if you can get those to me by mm, Thursday afternoon, I this, know it's a quick Thursday. turnaround. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's our retreat. <laughs> so basically, try to get them in the next couple days. Yeah. Um, can I have a motion um, for what I hope is a very brief executive session <laughs> for the purpose of the discussion of the hiring of a public official? So moved. Second. All, uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Mm -hmm. Intro. Yes. Aspen. Yes. Sims. Yes. Osh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Thank you all. And while we've got the camera still on, I just want to mention that next week's meeting is on Tuesday. The 21st. I saw some calendars had the wrong date. This is my special. Oh, oh, so Tuesday. All right. Did I have that correct? Did you? I do. Um, but where do, what do I do? Submit. Oh, just sign down here. Too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Sure. Got my yeah, seats are in the Can you pass this to Karen? Sure. This Thursday. 